So we're in the home stretch. We'll spend our two sessions uh, this morning on Anthony Cleopatra, and then the first session tomorrow we'll finish up on the play. And I want to leave the last session open for open discussion. Any questions you've developed about the whole play, all the plays, uh, and any larger questions you have about Shakespeare, Rome, literature, life, uh, whatever. Uh, and uh, we'll see where we can go with that. First, a footnote to our last discussion. I should have brought my notes along. Uh, here is a quotation from Cato the Elder. Uh, if I'd brought it yesterday, I would have known it was the elder and not the younger, who was the great-grandson of Cato the Elder, I discover from my notes. But I've been, I was referring to Cato the Elder's attitude towards Greece. This is from a letter addressed to his son, Maximus. In well, maybe his son, Marcus. In due course, my son, Marcus, I shall explain what I found out in Athens about the Greeks and demonstrate what advantage there may be in looking into their writings while not taking them too seriously. They are a worthless and unruly tribe. Take this as a prophecy. When those folk give us their writings, they will corrupt everything. And he was right. <laughs> but it, it, I, I am trying to show you that uh, uh, there's a reality behind Shakespeare's plays. I mean, he really did grasp what happened in Rome, and it was, it was a common view among Romans that their contact with the Greeks had corrupted them. So uh, uh, I'm hoping that each play f fits into this large puzzle we've been uh, looking at, and you can see how... Uh, these plays work together. I've been trying to suggest that Shakespeare works on a grand scale. The, the uh, constructed beauty of these three plays is extraordinary, how they fit together, but also the incredible detail with which he works, uh, so that when you find a strange scene like the one with Sin of the Poet uh, in Julius Caesar, if you really press it, you'll find there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in it. We actually don't have time to go through these plays in the detail they deserve, but at least uh, I think we've made a lot of progress with them. So in terms of Julius Caesar, we saw how the Roman Republican system is breaking down, or maybe even one might say has broken down by the time of Julius Caesar. Uh, look at it this way, that uh, uh, the participation of the people in the Roman regime is greatly diminished. Uh, the plebeians are accepting a passive role a role as spectators. You've now seen that they don't appear in Antony and Cleopatra. It's interesting that they were referred to only as spectators. Cleopatra, you note her concern at the end is that stories of her will be acted out in Rome. Uh, from being actors in the Roman regime, the plebeians become spectators. And the frustration of Cassius is that even the patricians seem to have no role anymore. This enormous frustration you see in Cassius as a representative patrician of uh, this class which had been used to ruling Rome, that there's now one man ruling Rome. When did this ever happen before? Cassius asks. Uh, uh, and uh, there's a uncertainty now. Uh, it's fascinating to trace how many people in Julius Caesar uh, talk about how their opinions have changed. Uh, we we talked, Jude, uh, Julius Caesar is said to have become superstitious uh, uh, of late. Cassius says, I used to hold Epicurus strong. Here's another example. Of, uh, it's on page 38 of Julius Caesar, the bottom, where Calpurnius says, Caesar, I never stood on ceremonies, yet now they fright me. People in Coriolanus don't change their minds. There's a downside to that. It's the problem in Coriolanus uh, that they, all the characters have fixed opinions and won't change them. Uh, 
Uh, now we see something different in, Korea, in Julius Caesar and the downside of that. Now people really are bewildered and questioning things, raising possibilities they never thought of before. They are open to new influences. They're looking at the heavens for signs in ways that nobody in Coriolanus uh, did. Uh, uh, and you see a kind of trade-off here that I think is basic to the Roman plays. Uh, as the political regime crumbles, new possibilities open up. Uh, as I said, in Coriolanus, Shakespeare seemed to want to explore the most fully political regime he could find, ancient Rome, uh, where the polis defined the comprehensive horizons of its citizens and got them devoted to the public good, to the city's cause, largely to war in a remarkable way, but at a price because we saw very little private life uh, uh, in Republican Rome. Even the family seems to have been absorbed into the city so that what Volumnia is doing is pumping out warriors for the city. Uh, now in Julius Caesar, we start to see what we think of as the dimension of private life. Uh, women complaining that their husbands either are too devoted to public life, Calpurnia discouraging Caesar from going to the Senate, uh, uh, Portia complaining that Brutus won't take her into his confidence about his, his public life. And the characters in Julius Caesar are quite fr frankly richer as human characters. Uh, uh, the characters in Coriolanus are one-dimensional by comparison. Maybe monolithic would be a better name uh, for it. Uh, now, I'm not saying that as a criticism of Shakespeare. It, people have criticized the play. Coriolanus is probably one of the least favorite of Shakespeare's tragedies with audiences and uh, critics, Titus Andronicus being the other one. Uh, I'm not saying that Shakespeare had lost his ability to create complex characters by the time he wrote this play. There are some idiots who would make arguments like that because obviously he's writing Antony Cleopatra, which has even more complex characters than Julius Caesar. I'm saying this is a deliberate choice on Shakespeare to rein in his own dramatic art, to not write those great to be or not to be soliloquies, to not have those great lyric passages, it is the East and Juliet is the uh, sun. Uh, 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 he's trying to characterize this Rome of the Republic and it is a very different kind of community and there's very different kind of people in it and they're not particularly complex. Uh, they do have one-track minds. They are focused on the city. Uh, but again, that's not a limitation of Shakespeare. It's a limitation he's trying to show in the characters. So there's a kind of trade-off here. As the regime weakens, the people get more interesting because they have more options now. They're not so clearly focused on the city. Uh, and so all sorts of new things open up in this late Republican Rome, uh, forms of private religion, individual soothsayers, people having visions. And again, Shakespeare had the option from his sources to show that in Coriolanus and deliberately excluded it. And we saw all his philosophy. Uh, we got an Epicurean in the play. We got a Stoic in the play. We got a Cynic in the play. We got an academic skeptic in the play. Uh, these people... In the Rome of Coriolanus, give, give me a break. Uh, uh, no one would have ever heard of these things. For one thing, they come after the historical period of the play, but, but it's one sign of the greater complexity of life that you have uh, the development of philosophies uh, in, in, in this world. Uh, so uh, again, Shakespeare understands the relation of a political regime to human possibilities. And that, yes, if you want this hyper-political regime of the Republican Rome, you've got to face the fact that there are other aspects of human life that are going to be suppressed uh, in Rome. Uh, on the other hand, you do face the fact that if you're going to open up these new possibilities, you're going to end up with a corrupt and decadent regime.
Uh, maybe not necessarily, but you see how these philosophies unhinge people, these new religious visions unhinge people. Uh, and and uh, uh, as you open up these possibilities in private life, you've closed down a lot of possibilities in public life. Yeah, this guy Julius Caesar is going to be the dictator for life, but what about all the other people uh, in the city? So uh, it's a good sense of how Shakespeare uses his exploration of different regimes to explore a, a wider variety of human possibilities than is possible in any one regime. So any questions about that, about what we talked about yesterday? Yeah. What was the order in which he wrote uh, the plays again, and how far apart were they? Okay, you know, again, these things are not set in stone, uh, though in the case of Julius Caesar, there's very good evidence it was written in 1599, and that it was written for the opening of the Globe Theater. That's one reason we have a good sense of the dating on that. Um, Coriolanus and Antony Cleopatra uh, were written uh, at roughly the same time. We do not know the order in which they were written, but I'll tell you that most scholars think Antony Cleopatra was written first and Coriolanus second. They are dated to 1607 to 1609. Uh, my best guess is they were written around 1608, 1609. Uh, so, uh, you know, they're, uh, and, and that, again, that's pretty well documented, though mainly on stylistic considerations and a few contemporary references. There was an insurrection over grain in the Midlands of England in 1607, and people think that triggered Coriolanus. Uh, uh, so, uh, so we do have the fact that uh, uh, it's virtually certain that Julius Caesar was written first and that after an interval of almost 10 years, Shakespeare wrote Coriolanus and Antony Cleopatra. What I'm saying is that that doesn't matter, <laughs> uh, that the plays can be reshaped uh, into a trilogy following the historical pattern. Uh, and what I, it is possible that when Shakespeare wrote Julius Caesar, he was already anticipating writing Coriolanus and Antony and Cleopatra, and he took a little time off to write a little thing called Hamlet and something called King Lear and so on. I actually think that's, that may not be true. My own view is that he did write, he wrote Julius Caesar uh, dealing with the great moment when the Republic turned into the empire, and then later in the course of uh, researching a play called Time of Athens, he came across the material of Antony and Cleopatra and Coriolanus and decided, uh, yeah, I could fill this thing out here. Uh, and being Shakespeare, he was able to create a trilogy uh, even though he'd never planned it that way uh, intentionally. I mean, one of the most striking things is the opening scenes of Coriolanus and Julius Caesar. It's you know it's hard to believe they're not meant to be read together and so on. But uh, again, there's uh, uh, a lot of precedent or examples of people who create something over long periods of time with a degree of unity that we can't believe, being just ordinary people. Uh, yes. Are they commonly held to be a trilogy? No. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, it's occasionally been presented. I was the first person ever to work out the idea in any detail. Uh, and uh, that argument has gained some currency. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, to me, I, I wrote a book called Shakespeare's Rome back in 1976. It was the first book that really took seriously the idea that Shakespeare was portraying Rome and that the Republic and the Empire were the keys to understanding the difference. There's a book by R.W. McCallum called Shakespeare's Rome Plays in Their Background, which came out around 1905 and had some of this idea, but, but in almost any book, you know, for example, in a book on Shakespeare, one of these big books doing all the plays, people would discuss Julius Caesar here, and then they discuss Coriolanus and Anthony Cleopatra there. They are frequently categorized together as the Roman plays, but largely with the sense that they're, they're Roman plays, not so much that they're a trilogy. And the idea that they're a historical trilogy uh, 
I can take some credit for being the first really to develop that idea. Uh, <laughs> any other questions that set me up to look good? Uh, I like that question. Uh, thanks for answering it. You'll get your cookie later. Uh, OK, let's turn to Anthony Cleopatra. And let's turn to page 117, Act 4, Scene 14, dialogue between Antony and a character named Eros. Eros was suppressed in the Roman Republic. <laughs> in the Empire now, we even got a character named Eros. Now, Shakespeare found that in the source, but again, he must have had a good laugh when he saw that. Eros, thou yet, behold, thou yet beholdest me, I, noble lord. Sometime we see a cloud that dragonish, a vapor, sometime like a bear lion, a towered citadel, a pendant rock, a forked mountain or blue promontory, with trees upon it that nod unto the world and mock our eyes with air. Thou hast seen these signs, they are black vespers pageants, I, my lord. That which is now a horse, even with a thought, the rack dislimbs and makes it indistinct as water is in water. It does, my lord. Now, in the original Cordo version, Eero said, what are you smoking, my lord? Uh, <laughs> this, and can I have some of it? Uh, this is a very, very weird passage here in the middle of a play. And it's everything that was lacking in Coriolanus. Uh, here, it just breaks completely out of dramatic dialogue. And Antony has a vision. And he's looking up at the heavens, and he sees a cloud. And the cloud transforms into a dragon, and bear, a lion, a towered citadel. And then everything dissolves and becomes uh, uh, indistinct. Uh, uh, as a contrast, in Coriolanus, everything is distinct. His mind works by distinctions. You can look this up. It's page 9. Uh, it's something that he says to the plebeians. He that trusts to you, where he should find you lions, finds you hares. Where foxes, geese. You are no sure or no that is the coal of fire upon the ice or hailstone in the sun. It's characteristic of Coriolanus that he hates things that melt. Uh, uh, he wants things that are solid. And the distinction among species is solid for Coriolanus. The whole world is divided up into categories, above all patricians and plebeians, and he doesn't want to see those breached. But Antony lives in a world where everything is dissolving and things become indistinct as water is in water. We do enter a very watery world in this play. Up to now, we've been in the world of Roman land armies. This play culminates in a great sea battle, much to Antony's misfortune, in fact. And the Romans seem unnerved by having to turn to the sea, and Antony's soldiers warn him against turning to the sea. But this vision here of a whole, the whole world dissolving, it, it's a good way of getting a handle of everything strange that's going on in Anthony Cleopatra. And this is a kind of poetry that just doesn't appear in Coriolanus. Now, again, the average literary critic would try to come up with some argument uh, that, as to why Shakespeare changed in between writing these two plays so that when he wrote Antony and Cleopatra, uh, the world was dissolving for him. And then he had a reaction to that and wanted to portray it more solidly. No, I say this is Shakespeare. He's capable of doing anything poetically. And this is a deliberate effort to contrast his two heroes here. And indeed, we've entered... Uh, uh, a, a world that is on the verge of disillusion, that as the, as the republic dissolves, Antony's whole world dissolves, and we get a kind of poetry that you just don't find in Republican Rome. It's much more beautiful as poetry. This is what we think of as Shakespeare here, this kind of passage. Uh, 
uh, where Coraline says, this and that, and this and that, and this and that. And Antony, it's all dissolving. So uh, it's one sign, even the poetic texture of these plays reflects the changes Shakespeare's trying to portray. Uh, now let's work our way into this new imperial world through the beginning of Act Three. One of you wrote a good uh, paper on this last night. Uh, so let's turn to pages 62 and 63. This is a scene uh, that is uh, usually omitted in most productions. I've, I've never seen it staged uh, in the play. Uh, 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 most directors think it's worthless. So it probably is the most important scene in the play <laughs> uh, and tells us a lot of what's going on. What does this scene tell us about how things have now changed as the imperial system starts to kick in here? Yes. Politics have become personal. Yeah. Okay. Follows it. When Ventidius fights, he's fighting under Anthony's banner, not necessarily for Rome. And when he would be awarded, Celia says that, uh, oh, so die grand Captain Anthony will award you. Not necessarily Rome. Yeah, I don't think there's a single reference to Rome in this passage. It's not you just want a great victory for Rome. Uh, it's you just want a great victory for uh, Antony. Yeah. Uh, yes. And then on page 63, Ventidius's statement, better to leave undone than by our deed acquire too high a fame when him he serves away. Um, there's the sense that before Coriolanus, uh, you know, he went to Coralie by himself, and he, he did it. But these people are much more deferential, and they don't want to step on anyone's toes. So if, if you're not in charge, you'll do your job, but you won't do anything more. And if there's, like, less... Yeah, ambition, it's the principle of Washington, D.C. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Um, you, you, you don't... Maybe you don't have that same ambition that someone like Coraline has, but, um, but um, they might be like a, a cultural lowering of ambition, but it's also just a it's, personal, I, I owe this man something, I, I don't want to upset him. Well, yeah, you know, it's not cultural, it's political. That is, we're seeing here the consequences of a different political arrangement. Now notice... Uh, the stage direction says, enter Ventidius as it were in triumph. Now, I told you yesterday you can't trust the stage directions. I will say that there are some signs, well, both Coriolanus and Antony Cleopatra have among the best texts of all our Shakespeare plays. Many plays like Hamlet and King Lear have horrendously bad texts. Uh, I personally believe that Shakespeare retired from active playwriting in order to start to prepare uh, an edition of his works, and he he managed to get a few of them well edited before he died prematurely in 1616, and it's very possible he started to work on his more recent plays, the best texts we have for The Tempest, Coriolanus and Antony Cleopatra. In any case, this is the scene that ought to lead to a triumph. Coriolanus won a great victory at Corioli, and they gave him a big celebration in Rome. Julius Caesar uh, won a big triumph over Pompey and is celebrated in Rome. That's pretty dubious, but still it's happening. That's what you did. Uh, uh, when you won a big battle, you got a triumph back in Rome, and it often was a step to becoming consul. Now, there still were consuls. Uh, at this point, uh, Hertius and Panzer are mentioned, who were in fact historically the last two consuls under the, the Republican order. But as I mentioned, Augustus Caesar did try to maintain the appearances of the Republic, and they still elected consuls. And I believe some of the emperors had themselves elected consuls. But Ventidius is not going to become a consul anymore in the old, meaningful Republican sense because we're now getting to a position where there's three, two, or one uh, men leading Rome, Lepidus, Antony, and, 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 and Octavius. Uh, and so, uh, as it were in triumph, this is what normally would lead to triumph, uh, uh, so thy grand captain Antony shall set thee on triumphant chariots, 
put garlands on thy head. But Ventidus knows that ain't going to happen. Uh, because, uh, you know, Comitius was very generous with Coriolanus. Uh, uh, these patricians under the Republican order welcomed each other's triumphs. But as this imperial order emerges, uh, the would-be emperor, and eventually the real emperor, is very jealous of any achievement. Now, in fact, uh, Coriolanus uh, points to this distinction uh, in a, uh, it's at the end of Act One, Scene One. It's you can, uh, it, it's on, on starts on page thirteen. Your editions you want to look it up. Uh, the tribunes are very cagey when they see Coriolanus appointed uh, uh, to serve in the wars under Cominius. Sicinius says, "But I do wonder." Coriolanus's insolence can brook to be commanded under Cominius. And Brutus answers, fame at the which he aims, in whom already he's well graced, cannot better be held nor more attained than by a place below the first. For what miscarries shall be the general's fault, though he perform to the utmost of a man, and giddy censure will then cry out of Martius, oh, if he had borne the business. Then Sicinius adds, besides, if things go well, opinion that so sticks on Martius shall of his demerits rob Cominius. Brutus says, come, half all Cominius's honors are to Martius, though Martius earn them not, and all his faults to Martius shall be honors, though indeed in aught he merit not. It's one of the best places to see the difference between the Republic and the Empire. In the Republic, it's best to be second in the army. It puts the premium on the guy moving up in the ranks. Uh, uh, if things go wrong, they'll blame the general. And if things go right, they'll credit the, the best of the soldiers. Notice the exact opposite now under the empire. Uh, Antony really is going to get the credit for Ventidius's victories, uh, whereas uh, if something goes wrong, Ventidius will be blamed. Uh, Ventidius is actually a fairly significant character in Plutarch's account uh, of Antony's life. He talks a lot about Ventidius. It, it, it's an irony. Ventidius was a foreigner probably brought to Rome as a prisoner in some triumph. And I, as I recall, Plutarch points out uh, he was the first person to be brought in triumph to Rome to get a triumph. I believe in Plutarch he actually does uh, get one. But in, 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 in Shakespeare's version, he doesn't even get a triumph. Now, this is, this is, he's fighting the Parthians. They were, in some ways, the last of the major enemies uh, on the eastern frontier. They had defeated a Roman army and defeated an army led by Crassus. Uh, and in fact, uh, killed him, and this was thought. To, this was a great shame to Rome. I believe they got the Roman standards, which was a big deal. The troops were never supposed to lose their standards to the enemy. So this would be a big deal to revenge the defeat of Crassus. But but Ventidius wants to play it cool here. Uh, uh, a lower place, note well, may make too great an act. It's interesting, these two parallel passages in uh, Coriolanus and Cleopatra both refer to the logic of the lower place in the system. By the way, look up Book 1, Chapter 30 of Machiavelli's Discourses, uh, which discusses just this issue and is probably good evidence that Shakespeare had read the discourses. Uh, but here we have uh, something new happening. Caesar and Antony have ever won more in their officer than person. It used to be the guy that won the battle became the consul. Uh, now you're starting to have these emperors uh, have the benefit of the army without having to actually uh, lead it. Uh, and now who does in the wars more than his captain can, becomes his captain's captain. And ambition, the soldier's virtue, rather makes choice of loss than gain which darkens him. What's happened here? Ambition. 
Anything seem strange about those words? Yeah. Uh, basically, that in the past, personal ambition was connected with civic virtue, but now if you want to be ambitious, you have to be under someone else. And therefore, if you are, if you shine too brightly, you would offend the person that actually gives you all your benefits. Yeah, that's the problem in the empire, but there's something even more striking here. And yes? Ambition causes you to make the choice to lose. Yeah. What would Corey Lane say to that? Reject that. He would say that losing is never good. It's never really what you want. Um, except for the fact that when his mother comes to him, he does decide not to act. Yeah, but the. Uh, <laughs> but there were circumstances. <laughs> but he, he still didn't like that, though. He, yeah. he said, You've won a great victory for Rome, but for me personally, this is a disaster. Yeah. Uh, but there's a process of redefinition here, and we're going to see this as characteristic of the play as a whole, that the whole of Roman ethics is redefined in this play, where the shift to the empire is, is more than just a political shift. Ambition, the soldier's virtue, makes choice of loss now. Remember, in the Republic, it is held that valor is the chiefest virtue, and valor is winning. Uh, I showed you that Julius Caesar ends with Brutus saying, I shall have more glory by this losing day. I mentioned the philosophy of losers. The philosophy of losers emerges. Yes? Yeah, I think a great example of this is when Antony flees battle. Uh, and goes after Cleopatra. I mean, like, I just, I was kind of laughing at the idea, like, what Coriolanus, if he had seen that, I mean, could you imagine his reaction to that? He'd just been, I mean, it's complete, kind of, uh, completely in contrast to kind of yeah. the Republican ideal of, like, battlefield courage. Um, yeah. Uh, or if Virgilia had said to him, if you love me, you won't go into battle today. <laughs> what, what an answer she would have gotten to that one. Uh, uh, if you love me, you'll shut up. <laughs> uh, uh, now, I want you to see the depth, uh, the depth of transformation here, that victory has become loss here. Ambition has become the very opposite of ambition. And we'll see how that works out in the terms of the play. This is what happens when you got one man ruling, or in this point, just a couple of men contending for one man rule. Uh, again, under the old republic, Ventidius would have gone out there, won a battle, and gotten his triumph and be on track to become consul. And he might have pursued the Parthians till there were no more Parthians left, uh, get as great of uh, 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 a victory as he could and drag as many Parthians home to Rome as he could. Uh, and now that isn't the issue anymore. The issue is what is my what is my uh, uh, commanding officer uh, think of me? Uh, we see this play is absolutely suffused with personal relationships, where everything's become personal now. Everything's a matter of personal loyalties. Uh, Let's talk about Pompey, because again, somebody wrote a good little paper on the Pompey uh, subject. I'm just looking at ver all the minor characters in this play reflect the major issues. Uh, uh, and so in Pompey's case, we see how, how things have changed uh, in this new world uh, of re Republican Rome. Uh, what do we see in the story of Pompey now? Yeah. Pompey was claimed that he was trying to avenge his father, by, who was defeated by Caesar, by defeating Caesar's lieutenants who were the triumvir, basically. But um, it became clear that that, uh, that claim was skin deep, and he, once the military fortunes turned against him, he really just gave in and accepted the peace terms. Which means got as much as he could get. He yeah, could. yeah. Uh, anything else on what his story shows? Yeah. 
when Rome has become very partisan, his, his initial idea of why he was going to win the war was because Antony wasn't going to come, and his war was going to be on the two things <coughs> only. And that idea just, I don't know, he's no longer fighting against Rome, he's fighting against a party with faction in Rome. And, and that was the reason why I thought he was going to win. Until <laughs> all the parties came together, then realized he just might not, because Antony was stronger. Yeah. There's also a moment um, when Pompey is speaking early on in Act Two, where he implies that if he hadn't moved against them, they would have sort of eaten themselves, and factions would have turned against themselves. And it's really the reason that they are able to unite um, at any moment is because he's actually moved against them, and he kind of regrets doing it in a certain sense. Yeah, it was uh, Rome was in a state of almost permanent civil war here. Uh, it's why people finally accepted Octavius's. Uh, uh, hegemony because it's like okay, let's let's just have one of these guys, and no matter how bad he is, at least we'll just have one of them, and we can stop the wars. Turn to forty nine, uh, uh, and to his speech there, uh, line eight. To you all three, the senators alone of this great world, chief factors for the gods. Now. I believe that's the only reference to the Senate in this play. Uh, uh, when uh, Octavius wants uh, the people to know about Antony's misbehavior in Egypt, in Shakespeare he says, let Rome be thus informed. In Plutarch, in the source, it says, let the Senate be thus informed. Again, it's characteristic that Shakespeare edited out that reference to the Senate uh, as I said yesterday, in fact, the Senate survived into Imperial Rome, and and uh, Octavius was very careful uh, to leave the Senate in place and increasingly make it a creature of the emperor, but he wanted to preserve appearances. And here you see a bit of what's happened here. Uh, uh, yes, senators are mentioned, but the idea is there's only three senators left. Uh, uh, to you all three, the senators alone of this great world. Again, I think this is the only reference to the Senate in the play, but the Senate has been reduced to these three guys. Uh, uh, then I do not know wherefore my father should revenge his warrant, having a son and friends, since Julius Caesar, who at Philippi, the good Brutus ghosted, there saw you laboring for him. What was it that moved pale Cassius to conspire? And what made all honored, honest Roman Brutus with the armrest courtiers of beauteous freedom to drench the capital, but that they would have one man but a man? This is the last gasp of Republican rhetoric in the Roman plays in, in Shakespeare's view of Rome. I mean, it's a reprise of what Cassius said, uh, but it really rings hollow. This is the last person to speak up for the Republic and what it represented, but they're now just courtiers of beauteous freedom. It's almost like it's an aesthetic thing for him now. Uh, and of course, as you said, uh, uh, when given, uh, confronted with realities, uh, he just gives in and takes the best deal he can get. You made me offer of Sicily, Sardinia, and I must rid all the seas of pirates. Then to send, this is the bottom of 50, then to send measures of wheat to Rome. Really interesting, you know. That's you know, we need that wheat now because we're given the plebe we're given the plebeians free wheat, so we need Sicily, uh, uh, and uh, and he takes the offer, and in a way, the, the, I keep saying each this of everything. This is in a way the end of the republic, when when the last spokesman for the republic cuts a deal. Give me a piece of the action. Uh, it's a kind of mafia-like moment here. And speaking of the mafia, what happens later in this scene? Oh, they, yeah. um, Menace, the Pompey second proposes that they just whack the three founders. <laughs> That's a good term for it, yes. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, how does Pompey react? Well, he says... Man, that would have been a great idea if I didn't have to be complicit in it. Yeah. And so then he just rejects it and 
goes back to drinking because he would have liked that to happen, but he doesn't feel as if he could uh, be a part of such trip. Yeah, that's a very Machiavellian moment, and you could. Uh, what would Machiavelli say of Pompey? doesn't know how to be altogether bad. Yeah, yeah, it's a perfect Machiavellian moment when you see whether this guy has the guts or not. Now, I think it, it just dawned on me that this is a good measure that Pompey the Great at least fought for the Republic and died in the process, and this is Pompey the not-so-great uh, here. Uh, uh, and this, I, this is a real glimpse of imperial politics. Uh, those of you who know something about Roman history, why is this a foretaste of Roman history in the imperial regime? Does it have to do with the fact that eventually the emperor's seat would be sort of auctioned off by the Praetorian? Uh, <laughs> What first happened before they auctioned it off? Well, they have to kill the guy. They yeah. Have to kill the yeah, a lot of emperors got assassinated. Uh, and I, I think, again, this is in the source, but I think Shakespeare is highlighting this because we now see uh, how illegitimate politics is going to become that the... Remember, you know, two consuls every year in 50 years, you could theoretically have 100 consuls. On the contrast, by contrast, in the empire, you could have one emperor for 50 years. Their, their tenure of office turned out to be a lot shorter in many cases, sometimes a matter of weeks. And there's one year when they had four emperors in one year. Uh, uh, so uh, there was a new form of turnover, and it was assassination. And the, cor the, the course to power is now crime. There's no legitimate way to become emperor other than being the child of the emperor or being adopted by the emperor or assassinating him. And a lot of assassinations <laughs> occurred or they were killed in one, one way or another. And so you have this, you know, on the one hand, you want to say the empire frustrates ambition because not everybody, it's very hard to become emperor. Uh, on the other hand, you know, once you become emperor, you're, you're, you're emperor for life. But this, this is reminding us that that life may not be that long. Uh, but you see here that Pompey, who in some ways is the last representative of the Republic here, <coughs> He's too honorable to take that course, though not honorable enough not to have wanted it to happen. But I mean, this is a this is a great scene for seeing how sleazy imperial politics is going to be. It's going to be buying off people, making deals, and maybe it's going to be assassinating uh, 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 the emperor. Uh, uh, so. There are all these transformational ways uh, in, in which Rome is affected. Now, okay, let's start to look at the story of Antony in this regard. Uh, you know, the common view is it's a love story, and Antony has been diverted from politics uh, by his love for Cleopatra, uh, and certainly in certain sense that's true. Uh, but my claim would be that that is not independent of the new Roman politics. Uh, yes, Cleopatra uh, is an endlessly fascinating and seductive woman, but how is his love for Cleopatra the product of this new world that he's in? It just seemed to me that he had tired of campaigning and of being in the political life of Rome and this kind of uneasiness with um, dealing with political life, so he just kind of rejected that and turned basically to debauchery in Egypt, where it was, you know, beautiful and party in Las Vegas all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, I think the geographic separation between Antony and Rome can't be underestimated. It's pretty easy to um, lose track of politics and be less interested in it. 
if Octavian has been given that portion of the empire and all he has to do is run Egypt. That's a good point that the worldwide scale of the empire is stressed very much in this play. Uh, the word world, I, I don't know, it's something like it comes up 37 times in the play or something like that. Uh, uh, and there's a, a great emphasis on distances, on messengers being sent across the Mediterranean, surprised at the speed with which they travel, sometimes surprised at the speed with which armies travel. But you really do get a sense in this play of a much larger world. Uh, y yes? Um, Octavius is permanent home is in Rome, and Antony is in Greece, in Athens. Do you think that Shakespeare's trying to bring a, another claim with Hellenization of Anthony? Yes, yes. Uh, 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 that, uh, you know... <laughs> Why couldn't Coriolanus have an affair with Cleopatra? Don't tell me they lived 500 years apart. Mm -hmm. But, uh, though that's a good point, but yes. It's travel between the, extended going next door and coming back to Rome, going next door. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. not really moving very far. Yeah. And it's a really, again, think of Shakespeare writing these two plays at the same time. You really get the sense of Rome being a small community in Coriolanus. Again, there's lots of references to topographical points in Rome. And Volsky land ain't Disneyland. And there's not much, it ain't Las Vegas. There's not much going on there. And you, you, they're not talking about the babes of Volsky land in Rome. Uh, and, you know, in a very simple sense, Coriolanus is never exposed to anything as exotic as Cleopatra. But now we're in a world where there's really a different uh, community out there. Yes. There's also, um, so we go to Julius Caesar on page 52. Almighty Caesar, dost thou lie so low? Are all thy conquests and glories, triumphs, spoils, shrunk to this little measure? Uh, so it goes to the point that you made yesterday yeah. with uh, regard to if Caesar, this great man, uh, was murdered. Uh, so it, it, this, it seems to shrink the importance of politics, right? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, what's the point if Caesar ended up uh, this way? Uh, let, me, let me just finish up on this size of the world thing. You re really get a sense of the size of the empire now. Uh, there, you know, it's Syria, Cappadocia, Lydia, I mean, all sorts of, re Parthia, all these regions are mentioned. What sense do we have of Rome? Just let, let's, so. Do you want to respond to that? Yeah, it, it, it's related. Uh, I don't think it should be underestimated that Cleopatra is not Roman, that she's Egyptian, and that uh, Anthony is looking away from Rome. It's not, it's, it's, it, yeah, there's yeah. no sense of Rome. Now, in fact, she's Greek. Are you aware of that, 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 that Cleopatra would be a Macedonian Greek? And if you want to talk, uh, that is when uh, uh, Alexander the Great's empire was divided up after his death. Uh, it went to his generals, and one of them was Ptolemy, uh, and Ptolemy founded, uh, you know, he got Egypt, and he created a dynasty there, of which Cleopatra was the last representative. Uh, the, uh, the, um, so if we're talking about still the Greekification of Rome. Cleopatra is actually an aspect of that, and but now, yeah, really Hellenistic Greece, the Greece of Ale the Greek world of Alexander the Great, and it's a very peculiar history. The uh, Cleopatra was the first Ptolemy who spoke Egyptian. Uh, uh, you know, uh, they ruled out of Alexandria, a city built and named after Alexander, uh, which had the great Alexandrian library, which was not a library of Egyptian uh, texts. It was a library of Greek texts. Uh, it was the main collection of Greek texts in the ancient world. The, the Greek tragedies we have were probably 
ultimately derived from texts that were in the Alexandria Library. Just point, you know, the, the, the play emphasizes her Egyptianness. I will grant you that, but it's worth thinking about uh, the fact that this Ptolemy dynasty was actually Greek and Cleopatra was famous for having learned Egyptian. And the, but, uh, you know, on the other hand, I should say the Ptolemies had a conscious strategy of adopting the pharaonic position. That is, they they dressed as pharaohs, uh, they, the, the, uh, they associated themselves with Egyptian gods. It's one of the great early moments of globalization or the fusion of civilizations as the, the Macedonian Greek civilization fused with the Egyptian civilization. It's very interesting to look at representations of Cleopatra that have survived from the ancient world. Some of them uh, picture her in a pharaonic role, uh, in Egyptian dress, assimilated to an Egyptian god. Others present her just as a Macedonian Greek. Uh, anyway, just a little background on that uh, st stuff there. But anyway, uh, uh, look at... Um, this is in the big banquet scene, uh, page, uh, uh, where is it? Uh, I'm just, uh, the, the um, fascination, uh, oh, it must be now. There's the scene where they all get drunk. Uh, uh, yeah, it's page 59. Uh, uh, you'll see there uh, how Egyptianized the Romans are becoming. This is uh, page 59, uh, line 98. Uh, this is not yet an Alexandrian feast. Or at the bottom of that page, they say, Let, shall we dance now the Egyptian Bacchanals? Uh, uh, what do they say about Egypt, these Romans? It's in this scene. What are they interested in? Yeah. Oh, at the beginning of the scene, they're making constant references to the fact that Caesar and Cleopatra were lovers. Um, and then they yeah. move on to discussing like the riches of Egypt and kind of the drunkenness of Egypt and how Romans can't necessarily compete with that or it's not respectful yeah. for them to be as drunk as the yeah, It's significant that just as Rome was becoming an empire, they encountered this thousands of years old empire, as if they get an example of it. And w you were going to make a comment? Yes, they are, they're also interested in the different um, land and the pyramids and, and the Nile and how, and how they measure its flow and crocodiles. Yeah, isn't it fascinating? It's like the National Geographic Channel uh, here. You see how, this is on pages 56 to 57, how, how fascinating they are as, as we are with this very different civilization. As some of you may know, there's a pyramid in downtown Rome. It's called Cessius's Pyramid. It was built by uh, uh, a, you know, a wealthy but, you know, not too famous Roman citizen, and he wanted his own pyramid as a tomb. It's very funny to see it. It's, it's actually was incorporated into the Roman walls, defensive walls, and it's part of the Protestant cemetery. So if you want to see the graves of Percy Shelley and John Keats in Rome, you go there, you'll also see this pyramid. It's a kind of narrow pyramid. It's not the size of the Great Pyramid of Giza, but it's a pyramid. And it just shows you, in fact, how fascinated uh, historically the Romans were with Egypt. If you go to the Vatican Museum, uh, 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 you will see that in the Egyptian, there's a pretty good Egyptian collection in the Vatican Museum. Uh, there's a whole segment of Egyptian memorabilia manufactured in Rome. Uh, like Rome was the China of the ancient world. They produced 
tourist items. Uh, uh, you know, I was just in Switzerland. You know, you go to buy a little model of the Matterhorn. It says "Made in China" on the bottom. And you go to in Rome. You went to buy a little model pyramid, and it was made in Rome. Uh, so they were they were absolutely fascinated. They were particularly fascinated. Uh, with Cleopatra, when Julius Caesar had his affair with her. And here you see them talking uh, about crocodiles. And you s now, this doesn't happen in Coriolanus. Nobody stands around wondering about the strange creatures they have in the Volsky land because it's just down the road. Uh, and nobody wonders about the strange buildings in Volsky land, but really see what it is to have a world empire now. It is to have access and exposure to all sorts of strange ways of life. And they are, they can be uh, seductive. Uh, looking a little later in Roman history, the Emperor Hadrian, which is about 100 AD, he, he built a villa for himself outside Rome, which modestly was one-third the size of the whole city of Rome. And it's fascinating to visit it because he had an Egypt section, he had an Athens section. It's, it, it, it's the first Disney World. Uh, he wanted to incorporate the whole of his empire into his own private villa. So if he, he loved Athens and he loved Greek things, if he wanted to imagine he was in Athens, he could walk to a part of his villa uh, and there was Athens and then he had, there's a, it's still there, this long pool that represented the Nile and there's Egyptian statues around it and you see the, the, this impulse. And so again, in some ways, Coriolanus never had this option Anthony has a lot of options now. Uh, uh, and so in the, in the wake of his disillusionment with politics, yeah, love becomes more important uh, to him. But what kind of ro love is it? Uh, 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 I, I pose this as a question, you know, and... Uh, uh, if all Antony cared about was Cleopatra, why don't they just run off? Or like uh, Edward VI and Wally Simpson, abdicate the throne and go have your love affair. Uh, yeah. In Act 2, Scene 2 on page 38, there's this description of Cleopatra and her ships yeah. And it almost seems like she's being compared to, actually, I think she is being compared to a siren. Yeah. Um, and their perfume and, and the mermaids, and she, there is like a reference to nymphs. And yeah. there, and she's be, referred to as an enchantress and magic. Yeah. And I think there's a sense in which Cleopatra's kind of supernatural. Yeah. And she's a god. I mean, she's a god. And, Anthony seems to be like under her spell. And there's that moment when his first wife dies where he yeah. kind of seems to wake up and he realizes, what am I doing here? And he has a moment, I think, of self-awareness. And that is replaced, I think, when he, he kind of returns to her and she, she gets him again. But there's a weird brawl she has over him and, and the way she manipulates him. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but uh, on the yeah, uh, there are reasons in his life though why he's more subject. Now, of course, you know she seduced uh, Julius Caesar. She seduced one of the Pompeys. I never get it quite right. I I don't. It's not Pompey the Great that she seduced. I think she seduced his son. Uh, but but anyway, there was one Pompey in there, uh, so uh, Gnaeus Pompey, I guess. Yeah, that's what uh, uh, Anthony complains about. Uh, uh, but what's the nature of their love? Is it is it? Yeah, it's a, it almost seems like a, a, an addiction for both of them. Yeah, but they don't. Uh, it's it's exceptionally dysfunctional and deceptive. Um, one of the first things that we hear Cleopatra uh, 
say about the relationship is when she tells Charmian to go and report of her her well-being um, or not on page 14. Um, she says, see where he is who's with him and what he does. I did not send him. If you find him sad, say I'm dancing. In Mirth, report that I'm sudden sick. Quick and return. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, she just gets some kind of pleasure out of yanking him around. Um, and he, he always uh, responds to it. Yeah, it is interesting that precisely the issue of imperial politics is the issue of this love, namely loyalty. This is a world in which all people seem to have left as personal loyalties, but that's very problematic because it makes those loyalties suspect. Uh, and again, uh, you know, in some ways obvious, but, you know, Coriolanus doesn't worry is Virgilia faithful to me? Uh, but, you know, she doesn't have to worry, is Coriolanus faithful to me? My lips have virgined it ever since, he says, and we can believe him. Uh, it's a world, the, again, the world of Coriolanus, a world where erotic impulses are very much contained. Uh, uh, Here's a world where erotic impulses are released. What's the logic of that, by the way, from the point of view of empire? Why, why encourage eros now? Yeah. Well, you in some sense constrained ambition and constrained other impulses. So if, you, if everything's constrained, people will rebel naturally. But if you give them other outlets, you play, you give them nice feasts and whatnot, then there's a way in which it's sort of the Versailles model. People are distracted from their political ambition because they really like nice clothes, nice food. That's a, that's a good analogy, yes. Yeah, going off Andrew's point, it's like uh, when Caesar's talking, or Julius Caesar's talking about how he wants the people around him, he wants them to be fat and fun-loving, and uh, they like plays and music because then he knows that they're not going to be you know, lean and aggressive and ambitious and going after his power. Yeah, in other words, this, this is a regime now that actively encourages eros because it's discouraging ambition in politics. It, yeah, it reminded me a lot of courtly love and the relationship between the, the lover and the cool beloved. And in fact, there's a line on page 17 that Angie says, Thy soldier servant making peace or war as thou effects. And the idea that Antony, he has subordinated his identity as a soldier to be a lover, and then Cleopatra can then dictate what kind of soldier he becomes or how he acts in war. It's very good. Do you guys know what courtly love is? Or okay, so, yeah, um, it's not Kurt, Kurt Cobain's <laughs> widow. Uh, courtly love. Yeah. So, so it reminds me, if anyone's read Lancelot, um, courtly love is often adulterous. And no, but not all the time, but um, the way Christian and Rassam Farid kind of talk about it, it, it's usually adulterous, so that's what it reminded me in this play. And it's the idea that you have this, this knight, or this, this hero, we'll say, this soldier, who has a woman that inspires him to fight. And in the true sense, he needs to be her slave. Um, and he does everything for her. And but they're often not together. <laughs> yeah. One of the things about courtly love is that it's not consummated, um, and it's this longing. And he does everything for her, and she's his master. And that's kind of a way, I think, of subduing ambition, because you're not trying to overcome social ranks or take over society. Um, it's, it's not political in a certain sense. It's more about love and this woman, and if you don't have someone to love, you're not as honorable. And she can inspire you to do great deeds and be a better word, but at the same time, if she says, no, don't do that, you have to lose, you have to lose. So, so we're talking about a medieval idea here, dates from about 1150 to 1200 
in the south of France, in Provence, and it's the origin of our ideas of love, to tell you the truth. It's where troubadours, it's where the original love poetry comes from. Now, you mentioned Versailles, you've mentioned courtly love, and remember that line I just quoted, courtiers of beautiful freedom? In a way, that's what we're seeing here. Uh, people become courtiers in this world. It's what an imperial world is. Uh, they're no longer these independent warriors who are striving in contention for rule. There's a court. Uh, uh, you, your virtues are those of a courtier. I think you're exactly right that Shakespeare is looking at a transformation of the world here that will eventually mean 1200, will eventually mean courtly love. There are extraordinary anticipations of it here. When Cleopatra dresses Antony for battle, it's a pure scene out of medieval romance. Uh, and I think indeed Shakespeare uh, uh, divines uh, all this, that this is a world now in which personal loyalty is key, in which pleasing the emperor becomes so important uh, and, and love becomes a part of this. Now, yes, go. I just wanted to make the comment that um, uh, Antony's sort of forced into this marriage with Octavia that isn't about love, it's about politics. Yeah. And so I think it's like it, it, that relationship, like romantic, I don't even know if you can call it a romantic relationship, but I don't think they're not affectionate though. There's a scene where um, they seem to, they, they like each other well enough, I think. It's yeah. just, uh, it's, but, that is a purely political. Yeah, but notice again, the personalism of the politics that, uh, you know, again, in the Republic, you could swear by the Republic. You know, you could, uh, we're getting together for the good of the Republic. There's no common good anymore, so for two men to ally, they got to do it through a marriage. That's much more medieval again, and indeed it leads to the world of courtly love where there's a, uh, a marriage you make for political reasons and then you have your love affair with Guinevere uh, and so on. Let's go to the very opening of the play because again I want to uh, uh, explore how different this love is. Uh, uh, let's start on the top of page five. This is where Antony famously rejects Rome. Let Rome and Tiber melt. By the way, again, pervasive imageries of melting in this play. Uh, Coriolanus is a world of hard things. This is a world of melting things. And the wide arch of the range of empire fall. Here is my space. Kingdoms are clay. Our dungy earth alike feeds beast as men. Now, there is the disillusionment with politics. Kingdoms are clay. Uh, uh, our dunning earth like feeds beast as man. The nobleness of life is to do thus. And as your notes point out, uh, uh, oh, your notes, uh, yeah, perhaps they embrace. Yeah, most people assume that they uh, have a real smacker there. Uh, <laughs> when such a mutual pair and such a twain can do it, on which I bind on pain of punishment, the world to wheat we stand up peerless. There's something very peculiar here about their love uh, and how he regards it. This is why they don't simply run off and lose themselves in the teeming mass of humanity of Imperial Rome. The nobleness of life is to do thus, and when such, when such a mutual pair and such a twain can do it, in which I bind on pain of punishment the world to wheat, we stand up peerless. And something very strange in Republican Roman terms is happening here. Yeah. Which obviously they stand up peerless is strange from a Republican standpoint. Um, and then I also think that there's an odd way in which he's saying, as such as and such a twain can do it, in which I find um, there's there's a weird way in which they're seen as a pair that is really sort of separated from the world that is um, going to sort of impose itself on life, but they're not part of uh, polity. Yeah. Now, 
we stand up peerless is a very Roman Republican claim. I mean, that's what they all claimed. Corey Lane is peerless. They all wanted to be peerless. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, go ahead. Sorry. No, well, it's just that the basis of your peerlessness has changed now. Yeah. Well, in Corey Lane, it was valor. Now it's love. And Excuse me, it's love. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, no, it's, you know, the nobleness of life is to do thus. Now, again, try to picture Corey Lane uh, smacking a wet one on Virgilia's lips and saying to everyone, the nobleness of life is to do thus. They'd say, man, what have you been drinking? Uh, it's just, you know... The nobleness of life for Coriolanus is to go out and kill people for Rome. Uh, uh, I talk, redefinition of Roman virtues, that's what this play is about. And here, you know, in some ways it couldn't be more explicit. Let Rome and Tiber melt, and that means the Republic. Uh, the nobleness of life is to do thus, and that has a real polemical force to it. It's make love, not war. Uh, but then he says, I bind on pain of punishment the world to wheat we stand up peerless. What's odd there is he seems to be rejecting politics, and yet he then invokes it in that he's passing a law here. Uh, uh, that the whole, uh, and the whole world has to acknowledge their peerlessness as lovers. Uh, in other words, the old political impulse is there to be famous, to be the best, to be admired by, in this case, the whole world, only now it's going to be as lovers. Uh, uh, that's new and, and very strikingly new. Uh, in a way, Anthony, he's redefining politics, he's redefining nobility, and you can you can see in a certain sense you can see why he's losing the old political game to Octavius, and so he's searching for a new basis. And you know, again, it's Brangelina. Uh, we know this in the modern world that this couple that the whole world looks up to and thinks of as peerless. Uh, uh, it, it's curious. There's almost a sense of modern celebrity here, uh, that uh, they will become famous as lovers. Uh, only our world has truly fulfilled this. Uh, uh, again, you guys are, do you know the story of the king of England abdicating to marry a commoner? Is that still, I mean, that was still a huge, I mean, a, a huge thing when I was growing up. The Duke of Windsor was living in Manhattan and, you know, also, this was the great story that this man had given up the throne of England for love. Uh, in some ways, it is what we're talking about here. Now, look back at page four. Uh, Really, their opening lines, we talked last time about the importance of opening lines. If it be love indeed, tell me how much there's beggary in the love that is being reckoned. I'll set a born how far to be beloved. Then must thou need, then, then must thou needs find out new heaven, new earth. What is going on here? I mean, they're defining a new kind of love. Yeah. They seem to suggest that their love goes beyond earthly things. It's a sort of an eternal. Yeah, and again, try to try to picture Coriolanus and Virgilia saying this. Yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting that um, Antony's line kind of recalls the idea of the importance of acquisition um, for Coriolanus and that political acquisition kind of conquering. Yeah. And here, Cleopatra needs to find new heaven and new earth to define his love. So it's kind of politically pointless. It's kind of rhetorical, his idea. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's this process of redefining things and redefining love. Love had a pretty circumscribed role in the Republic. Quite frankly, it was directed towards producing soldiers. 
Uh, and again, we we never get to hear a love duet between Volumnia and Mr. Volumnia, as it was probably known. Uh, uh, but you know, the, uh, love for one thing was circumscribed by the family. Uh, now, in the, and 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 incorporated into the city, uh, it was a legitimate. Relationship it was legitimated by the city. Now here, the legitimate love is deprecated. It's it's this relationship between Octavia uh, and uh, Antony, which turns out to be pretty weak, uh, in part because it is so circumscribed. Uh, Antony, we know, marries Octavia for political reasons. The logic of his relationship with Cleopatra is it's not political. In fact, it's it goes against his political interests. Yes? Yeah, that's uh, exactly what I wanted to bring up. There's a really interesting scene between Antony and a soothsayer. And the soothsayer yeah. tells him on page 41 that any time, if thou dost play any game, thou art sure to lose. Um, and I wonder how much of it is, we talked about that he was very close to Julius Caesar yesterday and how he can't possibly measure up to his heir in the sense that he can't politically take the place of Augustus. On the other hand, he could be involved in the same sort of infamous immortal, immortalizing affair. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that. This is a new form of immortality they're going to talk about here. Up to now, uh, the Roman option of immortality has been a straight political line. You know, you win a great military victory, you become consul, win some more military victories, and you're celebrated as a hero of the city. That's not enough for Antony. And in a sense, there's a contempt for its finity, for its finiteness. Are all thy conquest glory shrunk to this little measure? Uh, this, they act, what used to be so great in Rome now looks contemptible to Antony, in part because he's seen, you know, the not just the greatest Roman of them all, but the greatest man of them all did all this, and he ended up hacked up on the floor. Uh, and now there's the notion, is there something infinite? Uh, there's beggary in the love that can be reckoned. And the minute Cleopatra says, I'll put down a limit, I'll set a born how far to be beloved, uh, Anthony says, then must thou needs find out new heaven, new earth. By the way, where does that phrase come from? New heaven, new earth. It's what? It's from the book of Revelation. It's chapter 21, verse 1. Uh, 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 it just, we'll just file that thought away. Uh, uh, here, where the new heaven, new earth might be coming from here, and where the new definition of love might be leading. Uh, but again, you really see the transformation here uh, of a world where love takes on a new importance when politics uh, starts to look contemptible. Now again, part of it is a conscious imperial strategy you do not want ambitious young men anymore. You do not, if you're emperor, you don't want them to be thinking in political terms. Again, the Republic did everything to direct young men to politics uh, and to encourage their ambition. But the empire is going to want to discourage that. Uh, and so it's kind of bread and circuses for patricians now. Uh, uh, and you're bringing up Versailles is such a wonderful parallel because it, 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 Louis the Fourteenth diverted these nobles by bringing them to court and getting Moliere to stage the plays and uh, find, you know making them give up their military lives uh, in order to become creatures of the court and get involved in love affairs and be worried how about how they look and how they dress and again it's very much like the world world of courtly love. Uh, uh, I think Shakespeare really grasps where his world came from because uh, he lived in a monarchic world where the court was very important. 
And when you, ha yes, you had a whole court revolving about Elizabeth, and they had the cult of the Virgin Queen, and uh, who's more courtly than Sir Walter Raleigh, and writing poetry to the Queen, and dedicating poems to the Queen. Shakespeare realizes what, yeah, that that's the world of monarchy, the world of empire, the world of imperial systems. Uh, uh, and you see all the transformation here at the beginning, a new sense of immortality, a new sense of uh, infinity. And again, just the word new heaven, new earth. I mean, those are so such striking words. They, you would not find them in, in Coriolanus. Again, when he says there's a world elsewhere, he has no sense that that's a new heaven, a new earth. Uh, he doesn't, he's not thinking of a new world that transcends this one. But Antony is now. Uh, and part of it is the new sense of the whole world. Again, I said that word world appears a lot in this play because Rome has made the world one, it has put together the world. And by the way, yeah, we didn't fully pursue this. Uh, where does the city of Rome come up in this play? It's a trick question. It's actually very difficult to spot the city of Rome in this play. I don't think there's a single reference to the Capitol or the Tarpeian Rock or uh, uh, a lot of the Roman, the, for example, the big banquet scene uh, among the Romans occurs in Mycenaeum, which was the main Roman naval base and is on the east coast of Italy, the uh, opposite side from Rome. I don't think you can locate a single scene in this play in the city of Rome. Yeah, maybe 3.6. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, it says Rome, Caesar's house. Yeah, okay, all right, I'll give you that one. Uh, but uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, who knows where Caesar's house is? Uh, you know, and by, by the way, you know, that stage direction notices in uh, brackets there, it's not in the text. Uh, so <laughs> I'll get out of this. I mean, no, seriously, he could be, this could be in uh, Capri, uh, where Tiberius built his villa. It could, in other words, uh, there's, I don't believe there's a single scene where a topographical point of the city of Rome is mentioned, as happens throughout Coriolanus and even Julius Caesar. Uh, maybe you'll get me eventually there, but don't go with the stage directions because they're not authentic. In other words, Rome's, at the very minimum, Rome has become much vaguer here now. And indeed, it's always an amb ambiguity. Rome means the city of Rome, and then it means this larger entity. Now, in Coriolanus, the two... You know, there is just the city of Rome. But here, uh, uh, it's very hard to locate this. You know, and it's, again, it's funny, the Roman emperors, the, the, uh, uh, Hadrian built his villa in Tivoli, Tiberius built a villa in Capri. Uh, they were starting to get out of Rome. They didn't, uh, uh, and it isn't, you know, if you think about the law, eventually, uh, Constantine moved the capital to the east, to Byzantium, uh, the current Istanbul. Uh, in other words, you see the center of gravity of the Roman Empire shifting to the east in this play, and a, re a heavy easternizing of Rome. Yeah. I wonder, I just have a quick question about terminology what people would have referred to when they said Rome because I mean, Caesar just does just say welcome to Rome at one point yeah um, does that mean that they're just like in his general area of the yeah I mean again yeah yeah uh, uh, and again uh, I, I'm sort of exaggerating for rhetorical effect I'm not some of these scenes may take place in geographical Rome the city but you couldn't prove it uh, and and uh, at this point, welcome to Rome might mean welcome to Italy. Uh, 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 
uh, uh, yes. Yeah, there's no longer any meaningful connection to Rome as the city as there were as it was in uh, Corinth. Yeah. For example, there's no plebeians, uh, uh, and there's definitely a sense that the uh, the center has shifted. Anthony says, "In the east, my pleasure lies," and you know, ultimately, Constantine recognized that. It's 330 A.D., but but in moving the uh, the capital to the east, but really, yeah, at this point, Egypt became very important as a source of grain. A lot of the great Roman cities were on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean. Ephesus, for example, which you can still visit and is massively Roman. It's a large Roman city with a gigantic amphitheater and the classic Roman street, uh, and it's in Turkey. Uh, as were many great, uh, many, uh, 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 Herod built Caesarea, which you can visit in Israel. And it's got a vast amphitheater and a huge Roman aqueduct. And it's very, uh, many of the best Roman ruins are on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean, uh, Israel and Turkey uh, and Syria, though I don't recommend visiting them right now. Uh, uh, yes. Um, if I may go back to um, 1135 area. Yeah. When you said that Antony uh, is rejecting politics, but then also issues this decree yeah. and confirms it in yeah. this way. So this seems, is this just a basic tragedy? He still speaks of even nobleness. Yeah. It's odd to define love in terms of what is noble to me, especially for a person who's elsewhere and proclaims it's just about this situation. Yeah. Not about I mean, else. yeah, what we're seeing, I mean, we're seeing nobility redefined here. It's interesting. It, it it's the medieval conception. Uh, you know, Lancelot was a great warrior, but what's he really famous for? Guinevere. Uh, and you know, I, again, it's a, you know, it's a very good point of reference because if you look at medieval literature, they they it consistently redefines nobleness in terms of love. So that, for example. For the Middle Ages, the Trojan War was the story of Troilus and Cressida. Not, uh, when you look at medieval treatments of the Trojan War, it's Boccaccio's uh, story of Troilus and Cressida, it's Chaucer's. They've virtually forgotten Achilles. Achilles becomes a lover in the Middle Ages. They make up a love story for him. Uh, uh, so, so this, you know, more power to you for not accepting this, but and for staying true the the ancient classical world. But what we're, I mean, in some ways, what Shakespeare is doing in these plays is showing us how we got to his world from the ancient world, and the transformations are occurring here. And in a way, it's a, a transformation of the definition of nobility and even of the nature of politics that these people should become famous as lovers and. You know, here's the twist to it. He he is not simply content to have a wonderful love. He still wants to be a noble Roman, and he still wants the world to look up to him and say he's peerless. It's just going to be on a new basis. Uh, it's quite amazing. So we so we can. This is an overstatement then to see all three of these plays as treating loves in various capacities. Coriolanus's love for valor for Rome itself yeah. as definable. Rome getting bigger and bigger and in the inability to love this thing because you can't even really see it anymore. Yeah. And then retreating to an individual love. And retreat might be the too strong a word. Yeah. Pulling into something that's clearly in front of you. Yeah. That can be your own as well. Yeah. Can yeah. No longer yeah. Because so what I'd like to own. stress is the publicity of love as Anthony conceives it. It must be public. That's why, uh, you know, uh, they... The, they can't pursue the obvious option, which would be just to run off if all, you know, it's like these movie stars who say, oh, I hate the paparazzi. Don't photograph me. Leave us alone. Uh, Angie and I just want to be alone. And then, and then it's, where's the photographers? Uh, how come they're not photographing us naked anymore? You know, it just ain't no fun if they're not photographing us. Uh, so it's just, it's amazing the, the publicity of Hollywood love. 
uh, and these people that just can't live without publicity. Uh, and in a way, we see that here. Uh, yes? Well, I was just going to say, I mean, I think that, I mean, not only does it show the tension between love and politics, because they're both all-encompassing things. I yeah. think the tragedy is that the way in which Antony portrays love is that it he loses all self-control. People look at him, they say he has no control anymore. Yeah. He is a, a strumpet's fool. Um, and, but he's saying this is immortal, it's all-encompassing, but then it's completely in tension with his political life. And I think it's interesting to see the contrast between Caesar and Antony. Um, on page 59, when they're having all this revelry at this yeah. banquet, yeah. and Antony tells Caesar, be a child of the time, and Caesar says, possess it, I'll make answer. But I had rather fast from all four days than drink so much in one. And then on the next page, Caesar excuses himself for graver business and frowns at this levity. So I think that what Caesar is questioning is the seriousness. I think if you look at the courtly love tradition and things like um, the Persian text Vis and Ramin and Troilus and Cressida, there's a sense that there's a seriousness to um, love and that it's ennobling in the sense that Colleen mentioned. I just don't Get, I've never gotten that sense from Antony and Cleopatra. I tend to be a little bit more in Aurora's camp that there's, this isn't exactly the height of love. Um, it's not Pride and Prejudice. It's not uh, any of the Good great for you. I wish you could tell this to my colleagues uh, because literary critics are complete suckers for the love of Antony and Cleopatra. I can't begin to tell, not all of them, but it's just amazing uh, how they buy into this as the perfect love and the greatest love and the infinite love. And yes, politics is contemptible. Anyway, let, let's take our break here uh, but, and come right back to this, the, these issues. But just, yeah, what we're seeing here is an attempt to redefine love and in a way redefine politics, redefine the notion of nobility. It's very good of you guys to question that. It's showing some ancient backbone. Uh, there, but uh, so anyway, let's take our ten minute break here. Uh, we got to Octavius at the end of last time, and let's talk about because this is the man who will be Augustus Caesar, and we actually see the the early signs of that in, in, in this play. Uh, so let's talk about Octavius. Uh, what his role in the play, why he, why he triumphs, uh, and what does Shakespeare think the emperor is going to be like? So that was a good scene to look at, actually. That scene where Octavius resists the getting drunk, but I will point out he does get drunk. Even Octavius gets drunk. Uh, in this world. That, that's one sign uh, of how transformed things have become. So on page 60, uh, a strong Enobarbus, uh, Caesar said, strong Enobarbus, weaker than one, and mine own tongue splits what it speaks. Uh, so uh, I actually find it a measure of how decadent and transformed the empire is that even the normally sober Octavius gets drunk, but tell me something about Octavius. Oh, and wasn't properly mic'd, wasn't following my director's signals. Uh, uh, well, he maintains an aspect of family in that he, he really loves his sister and that he wants her to be happy. Um, I don't know how he does that by marrying her off to uh, Antony, but he, he still like maintains that Roman aspect of um, respect and love for family yeah. that you don't really see from uh, Antony. Now, might it, though, be a sign that that respect might be superficial, that in fact he uses his sister? Uh, it is interesting that, again, the actual Augustus Caesar made a big deal of trying to promote the family and restore what we would call family values uh, to Rome. Uh, it is interesting, again, historically, Augustus realized that uh, 
uh, although he didn't want to return to the Republic, in some ways he did want to return to Republican virtues under his role and made a big play for that. Now, did you have something to add? Yes. Um, I mean, he's the villain. He's um, cold and calculating and deceptive. So he tells Cleopatra that if she complies with uh, the demands of the Romans, that she'll be treated very well. Um, and we find out from Dolabella that that's not what he intends at all. He intends to lead her and triumph and humiliate her. Um, and that's a huge impetus for her suicide. Yeah. It's interesting that, I mean, you say outright that he's the villain, because uh, that would mean that Shakespeare's attitude towards the emperor is quite hostile. Uh, uh, many people try to present Octavius in a more positive light because they assume that Shakespeare living under a monarchy uh, would support uh, one man rule and Octavius is the principle of that. I, 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 I myself hesitate to go as strong as saying he's the villain, but I do think he's presented very negatively. He's presented in the beginning as kind of the most mature character, the, the one who has Rome's best interests, or who's trying to hold together the, the political side of life. Um, but towards the end of the play, when you see Antony and Octavius fighting, you and Antony starts to bring up how Octavius is younger than him. Yeah. And it's this boy that he's fighting. Yeah. And there's a sense in which Antony views himself as better, as like a better man, because he has more experience and in his life is going to match up against this boy who's trying to tell him what to do. It's certainly one of Antony's frustrations. Uh, and more, more specifically, what does he object to about Octavius? Uh, Why, for example, does Antony think he's superior to Octavius? What does Antony want from Octavius? <laughs> What does he ask from him that uh, ask of him? He challenges him, right? Yeah. yeah. To one and one. Yeah. yeah to, and why would he do that? Because he can beat him. Because he's a better soldier. Uh, and, you know, it's funny. In some ways, Antony represents... <clears throat> the new principle in the play, in some ways he recurs to the old republic when the leader was the best soldier. Uh, look at page 90, uh, Act 3, Scene 13. Uh, Tell him he wears the rose of youth upon him, from which the world should note something particular. His coin, ships, legions may be a coward's whose minister would prevail under the services of a child as soon as in the command of Caesar. I dare him, therefore, to lay his gay comparisons apart and answer me decline, sword against sword, ourselves alone. Now that's very Coriolanus-like. Uh, let's settle this by single combat. That's the old Roman way. Octavius laughs at that uh, because he doesn't need it. Uh, and indeed, you see here, his coin ships legions may be a carrot. This is what we saw happening in Act 4 of Julius Caesar, that who wins is starting to turn on who's got the most coins, who can pay uh, the biggest legion. And indeed, Octavius presides over a war machine, doesn't need him out front. He doesn't need to lead his troops into battle. Uh, uh, he isn't a physically prepossessing man, an intimidating man, the way Coriolanus or even Antony is. Uh, so again, this transformation to a, a system and uh, notice that even the emperor is relatively passive 
in the empire, again, you, you win because of the war machine you have, not because of something you actively uh, do. Anyone want to defend Octavius here, say something on his behalf? I mean, at least he's actually trying to rule. But, uh, he, he, he's acknowledging that he has certain responsibilities as a statesman, whereas Antony is just... He doesn't even know what's going on in Rome or Egypt because he's so preoccupied with his frivolity and his love with uh, Cleopatra. Yeah, I mean, there's not many alternatives in terms of like a good someone you want to root for um, in this play. It's interesting because I mean, Antony's kind of he's just spineless, and then Pompey gets killed, so you kind of you just don't really have many options. So, yeah, it is. Uh... Again, Cleopatra says, "'Tis paltry to be Caesar." And that is the impression that you get in this play, that politics really uh, has lost its luster. Uh, the, uh, uh, the sense is that there's now this big empire which almost runs itself. You know, that's what Antony is saying. You could have a child up there. Which again, is characteristic of empires that you can have some, uh, by the dynastic succession, you can have a child in power. And the empire will continue to function uh, because what it really turns on now is the army. Uh, but indeed, it's very difficult to look at this play and find someone who's admirable politically. I'm, I'm actually glad to see how many of you uh, aren't taken in by Antony and Cleopatra. Because again, there's a, a, a very uh, substantial portion of the criticism of the play simply accept, accepts their love as wonderful, and perfect, and infinite, and this, this is what life is about. Uh, and, uh, they are a glowing example of the triumph of love uh, over politics. Uh, uh, the irony to me of that is for them, love is a new form of politics. And they, uh, 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 how does their behavior politically look? Either Cleopatra or Antony. One interesting question would be to ask yourself, how would you feel as a subject in one of their, uh, under them? Uh, uh, What's characteristic of their behavior as rulers? Yeah. Well, Cleopatra seems to be using Antony to get power and to consolidate her power in Egypt to kind of remove herself from the Roman Empire. Um, yeah, historically, that's very true. Yeah, and she says that she she calls in 2.5, she says, uh, I, uh, music is the food of us that trade in love. So she seems to be... Like, that's what she uses to get her way and to get power. Um, so while Anthony is besotted with her, um, it seems like she's using him, even though she likes him, she's using him um, <coughs> as a means to an end, namely to be the empress or... Uh, yeah. uh, again, it's, it's an interesting point that she is not uninterested in power. Uh, and again, historically, uh, she was in a feud with her brother, uh, and she first used Julius Caesar. Uh, I think Caesar executed her brother for her, uh, but but she was not first in line for the Ptolemaic throne, and she used the Romans to come to power, and then used the Roman alliance to stay in power. Yeah. Yeah, I think Sheila makes a great point um, on one forty. Uh, this is Cleopatra's kind of at, at the end when she's contemplating uh, suicide. Um, after she figures out that Caesar plans to like parade her as kind of a conquest, um, she kind of she she's uh, discussing with Eras, her her slave, and her reasons for wanting to kill herself are first and foremost political. I mean, she says, uh, "Thou an Egyptian puppet shall be shown." She's kind of showing how they'll be. Um, kind of, I shall see some squeaking Cleopatra boy, my greatness. So she's seeing how that if she if she stays alive, she'll be politically kind of mocked. She'll, she'll lose all of her power. And not until um, two twenty nine does she mention like we've been talking about how the, the afterlife appears um, in Antony and Cleopatra. Not till two twenty nine does she say, 
or 228, I am again for Sidness to meet Mark Antony. Um, so you'd think if she was like all about love, you know, her, she'd say, I want to kill myself so I can meet my lover in the afterlife. But yeah. it's not that. It's I don't want to meet, be made a fool of. Um, yeah, it's uh, uh, she toys with Octavius at first as if maybe she can seduce him. Uh, and it's when that falls through uh, and she learns that she's going to be captive of Octavius that she makes a decision uh, to kill herself. Uh, how, does he, how does she treat her subordinates and how would you characterize her court? We've talked about courts here. Uh, yeah. I mean, at least her maid servants seem to be rather foolish in the, in the sense that I remember at the beginning of the play, uh, one of them says, oh, just give Antony whatever he wants um, and that's how you'll keep his love. And she's like, you're an idiot. That's not... The way to lose that's him. That's how I'll lose him. Um, yeah. So, like, and when you listen to, like, the dialogues between the servants, they don't seem to be philosophical or they're just more uh, body and um, I don't know. <laughs> who's, who's in her court, first of all? What does a court consist of? Women, you said she's got a maid servant. Women and eunuchs. Interesting court. Uh, uh, again, it may suggest something of what Egypt uh, represents in the play, uh, there are real challenges to the old Roman manliness in this play. And she dresses up Antony in women's clothing. She takes his sword. Uh, a lot of interesting uh, uh, resonance uh, with that. Uh, how does she treat messengers, for example? Well, she, uh, <laughs> she essentially attacks a messenger. I mean, she's just in a fit of rage. Yeah, she, she apologizes, but I, I it's a little it's consolation. The, the all-time case of shoot the messenger. Uh, indeed, what's the problem with these messengers from her point of view? They don't give her the news she wants to hear. Yeah, and this is a problem that Shakespeare repeatedly shows of rulers and the the story of King Lear is all about this. Uh, uh, one of the problems he shows with rulers is the problem of shooting the messenger. That is, they want to hear what they want to hear, and they punish people who give them unwelcome news and reward people uh, uh, that give uh, uh, welcome news. And the result is they're cut off from the truth about the world. The sequence with the messenger is hilarious. And indeed, a lot of this play borders on comedy for that reason when he, he, he finally gets the clue that he should describe Octavia as ugly to Cleopatra. And that hilarious moment when he, when, when he said, oh, she's really old. She's about 30. And Cleopatra's really ready to kill him. She was, I think, 39 uh, at the time of this. Uh, what is that characteristic of uh, what kind of ruler treats messengers this way? It's a nasty term. Tyrant, yeah. Uh, how do both Andy and Cleopatra behave tyrannically? Again, they're... they're, they're Many fans among literary critics don't like to explore this, but uh, uh, yeah. Well, and um, Antony, he also, uh, one of Caesar's grievances with Antony is that he doesn't respond to the messages that he sends to him. So yeah. even Cleopatra says, you know, you should probably pay attention to these messages that are being sent. And what does Antony do to a messenger? who comes to tell him Caesar's response. Yeah, in the beginning, he basically like shoes him out and refuses to listen to what the message is. Yeah. I think that's what... Um, but Yeah, but later in the play... He tortures him. Right? He whips him. Yeah. He has a messenger whipped. Uh, well, no diplomatic immunity in Antony's court. Uh, uh, 
in, in, in many ways, they really do behave like the classic tyrant or the oriental despot. There's a very strong orientalism in this play. It's the standard image of the eastern ruler uh, who's surrounded by eunuchs, uh, uh, who uh, 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 torments messengers. Uh, there's something very arbitrary and capricious about their rule. Uh, again, when you contrast it with the Republic, uh, where there were supposed to be institutional constraints and procedures that people observe, they really kind of make up rule as they go along. Uh, in part, it's this idea that, well, they're so great that everybody should do what they say. Uh, by the way, you know, uh, here's one of the things that Caesar complains about. Uh, uh, Act 3, scene 6, so page 73. Uh, in the marketplace... Uh, on a tribunal silvered Cleopatra and himself in chairs of gold were publicly enthroned at the feet sat Caesarian, whom they call my father's son, and all the unlawful issue that their lust since then hath made between them. Uh, Unto her he gave the establishment of Egypt, made her of lower Syria, Cyprus, Lydia, absolute queen. By the way, he, well, I mean, this in the public eye. In the common show place where they exercise his sons, he there proclaimed the kings of kings, great Medea, Parthia, and Armenia. He gave to Alexander, to Ptolemy, assigned Sirius, Cilicia, Phoenicia, she in the habiliments of the goddess Isis, that they appeared and off before gave audience as tis report. So let Rome be thus informed. That, by the way, is where in Plutarch the lines, let the Senate be thus informed. It's where you see Shakespeare erasing the Senate uh, from Imperial Rome. And also, this is a good passage to illustrate what I was saying about the great geographic range uh, of the play. Uh, 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 the mention of Syria, Cyprus, Lydia, Armenia, Parthia, Media, and so on. Why is this so uh, outrageous by Roman standards, what they're doing here? Yeah. Well, um, like in the conversation um, with Enobarbus on page 39, where Enobarbus talks about how Cleopatra... Um, he says, I saw her once hop 40 paces through the public street, and having lost her breath, she spoke and panted that she did make defect perfection. And there's this sense that she's so enchanting and so alluring that she makes defect perfection, that holy priest bless her when she's riggish. I mean, this is like a complete inversion of the Roman Republican ideals of um, thick hardiness and um, vigor and valor i mean it's it's very seductive but at the same time like it's so problematic that there could be someone that would make defect perfection yeah. uh, and antony is really caught up in all of this yeah. specifically what's so unroman about the process described here yeah it's kingly uh, even even octavius when as, as was mentioned before, when, when he takes power, he still keeps the messages of the Republic. He keeps up the charade. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. Um, he's also placing illegitimate children in power and thereby like subverting the Roman family model. Yeah, it's a, it would be an aspect of the tyrannical nature of the regime that it's illegitimate at its core, rests on illegitimate children. Uh, what kind of kings are these? <laughs> the... Uh, uh, Were there kings like this in the ancient world? Notice it's even proclaimed kings of kings. Uh, th this is really oriental despotism here. Uh, that, that's what I mean, that it's very un-Roman because up to this point, no one in Rome would set himself up on a throne and proclaim his divinity. There's a certain irony here in that Augustus is be going to become a god king. Uh, and he probably doesn't even know it here. 
Uh, but in some ways, this is going to become a model for the Roman emperors. But at this point, it's still outrageous in Roman terms. It's also as interesting that Alexander is mentioned here. These, uh, this kind of kingship is also known as Hellenistic kingship. It's characteristic of the kings that followed in the wake of Alexander, people like Ptolemy. The strategy of the Hellenistic kings. Now, again, these are people who became kings uh, in what we call the Middle East, and uh, 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 they they proclaim themselves as divinities. Again, the Ptolemies put themselves on the Pharaoh's throne in Egypt and linked themselves to the gods. Cleopatra historically did link herself to Isis and so on. So this is all very oriental, very despotic, uh, but also very Hellenistic. Uh, and again, the mentions of Ptolemy and how Alexander uh, point to that. Uh, but in fact, it shows the transformation uh, of Rome. It, it struck me uh, that in curious ways, Octavius and Antony are the prototypes of the Roman emperors, of the two basic categories of Roman emperors. What do I mean by that? <laughs> you all have got images of Roman emperors uh, in your mind. Who do you think of when you think of Roman emperors? Marcus Aurelius. Okay, that's a, you go for the good ones. Uh, Marcus Aurelius and Nero. Uh, there we are. Uh, why do I say those are the two pro, those are the two typical Roman emperors? One was stoic and very serious, and the other was sort of crazy. <laughs> yeah, and can you see that? That's Octavius and Antony. Uh, that is, uh, you know, some Roman emperors we think of as the great administrators uh, who took their jobs seriously and and ran the empire pretty well and tried to respect law and order. And, and we have to give Octavius some credit because uh, he established that model. Uh, 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 tried to downplay uh, his role as the, the one-man ruler and he encouraged virtue in Rome. And there, uh, it's actually remarkable that there were any good emperors, <laughs> considering how tempting it was to be a monster uh, as emperor. But the idea of the emperor as a f almost faceless, emotionless, good administrator, you can see that emerging in Octavius. There's not much personality there, uh, and that's people like Marcus Aurelius or uh, uh, Vespasian and Trajan and Hadrian. There were some pretty good Roman emperors. On the other hand, there's Nero. Tell me about Nero. Well, um, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with Roman history, but he's famous for what was it? Uh, Fiddling while Rome burned. Yeah, he, you know, per, I don't, you know, pers persevered Christians. Who were some of the other bad emperors? Caligula. 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 And what did he do? Didn't he order his army to attack the ocean? Mm -hmm. did he? Yeah, 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 I think so. <laughs> he yeah. yeah, he had his true. I think a senator. I think he appointed his horse a senator, uh, <laughs> which was a big improvement, actually. In the, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 but you know, we think of these emperors. Well, what el what else do we think of the bad emperors? Commodus. Oh, Commodus is another one. Marcus Aurelius' son, by the way. Uh, played by Joaquin Phoenix. Uh, 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 <laughs> hey, you got to get the history straight. Uh, but you know what? When we think of a bad Roman emperor, the governments took massive amounts of land from like the senators and sort of acquired them into these large estates. Yeah. What? What else? In, in general, this, the worst use of arbitrary power. 
Okay, they're, they're very arbitrary. Uh, they rule capriciously. What else? They're depraved. They're depraved. <laughs> very good. Uh, and what does that mean? <laughs> They are sexually deviant. Yeah, where are the orgies? Come on, guys. We finally got to the good part of Rome. We Caligula, Nero, they're having these orgies. That's Mark Antony. It's very funny. Uh, Plutarch's life of Antony ends by pointing out that he was the uh, that one of his descendants was Nero. Nero descends in a direct line from Mark Antony. Uh, I wonder if that registered with Shakespeare. But it's, again, this play is remarkable in that, in a sense, it predicts the whole history of the Roman Empire uh, uh, from the moment of its founding that you're going to have Octavius's and Antony's. You know, in some ways, at best, you're going to get a bureaucrat who run things in a pretty orderly fashion. Uh, and, and kind of keep a lid on Rome at best. But then you're going to get these Hellenistic god kings whose power is going to go to their head, who are going to whip messengers, uh, have uh, rule arbitrarily, uh, party, <laughs> party till it's 1999 A.D., uh, uh, and just... Uh, uh, make a mess of Rome. Uh, 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 you know, Antony is, is really prototypical of many of the Roman, uh, Roman emperors. Uh, and you wouldn't... You, you know, I have to say, if you had to choose who you'd want to live under, I think you'd be better off living under Octavius than you would be living under uh, Mark Antony. So... Uh, Shakespeare seems to have a very negative view of what imperial politics is going to be like. Uh, uh, now, it, on the other hand, there are, again, all these new dimensions of life uh, that are opening up, especially some new kind of form of love that uh, is in its own way attractive. Uh, Ina Barbus is a very interesting character in light of you know trying to figure out what life under the empire is going to be like. What can you tell me about Ina Barbus? Uh, uh, well, by the way, it's played by a young Patrick Stewart in one of the movie versions of Andy and Cleopatra, which, in which he's the best thing in the cast. Uh, what's his story? What's his problem? What does he represent? Yeah. Well, maybe as a character, he's just, uh, he's a very close friend of, of Anthony. And to a certain extent, he serves as a good commentary on Anthony's character and the decision he makes, because he seems very honest and, and very noble. But then it comes to a point where he has to choose between being loyal to his friend and, I don't know, uh, suffering for the bad decisions his friend does or deserting and going over the other side. And he does desert. You know, it's a, it's a very good measure. I mean, he, it seems to me, is uh, at first is one of the most admirable characters in the play, one of the few people we can trust. Uh, what, what's good about him? Yeah, I, I mean, as an audience member, you, you kind of feel for him when he looks back at his he, what he considers a betrayal um, of, of Antony, and, and he's very repentant, and he feels genuinely very yeah. bad about had, being a master lever. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, that's jumping ahead to the end of the story. But you know, earlier in the play. Why is he, uh, you know, someone we admire in the play? Yeah, he seems to give solid advice. Yeah, yeah. Favorite yeah. line that uh, that truth should be silent. I had almost forgot. It. Yeah, yeah. He's another one of these uh, characters who's not listened to. Uh, it's a big mistake not to listen to him because he's reasonable. He's always cautioning Antony, uh, reminding him of his obligations. By the way, he's another 
left over from the Republic. Uh, in some ways, he's the kind of guy that made the Republic work. A uh, good soldier, uh, you know, presumably a good fighter, uh, and uh, you know, someone who's trying to do the reasonable thing and stays loyal to Antony for a remarkable amount of time. But typically illustrates the problem of this world that you're no better than the guy you're fighting for and everything's come down to personal loyalties and eventually he can't bring himself to follow Antony into defeat uh, and leave, leaves him for... Uh, Octavius Caesar, but that doesn't work out for him, him either. He's a, you know, in some ways you see the emptiness of this world, especially for people who have one foot in the old republic. It's just a very difficult world for them now. Uh, uh, to the extent they stay loyal to their old principles, they end up in a self-defeating uh, 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 position. Uh, uh, let's look at the uh, yeah the uh, one is a scene where he uh, uh, gets his treasure back. Uh, where is that? Uh, um, one of the yeah, yeah, yeah. You see what happens to him there. Uh, uh, I am a. This is yeah. What I'm saying. I am alone. The villain of the earth and feel I am so most. Uh, o oh, Antony, thou mine of bounty, how wouldst thou have paid my better service while my turpitude that does so crown with gold? And he just, I will go seek some ditch wherein to die, the foulest best befits my latter part of life. Uh, you know, this is a guy who would have been a good soldier in the Republic and could have had a good distinguished career in the Republican armies. Uh, and now it, it it doesn't work out. Indeed, Antony Antony is not a good captain for his soldiers. They keep objecting to what he's doing. And let's yeah, let's talk about that. What uh, what's his big mistake as a general in ter terms of the play? Very emblematic. Yeah. After he sees Cleopatra's ship fleeing, he yeah. follows her. Yeah, but even before that, the new what, what? The nuclear yeah, but even before that. Oh, going to sea, fighting at sea. Fighting yeah, at sea. fighting at sea to begin with. Uh, and, you know, that's interesting. And the Romans were basically a land army. Now, the Carthaginians were a sea power, and at first they gave Rome a very hard time the Romans had to capture a Carthaginian ship and reverse engineer it uh, uh, to be able to uh, uh, combat the Carthaginians. And eventually, typically, Rome was able to build a bigger, na bigger navy than Carthage's and defeated Carthage. But, uh, and obviously, they had to be a naval power uh, to command the Mediterranean. But their great strength was their land armies, uh, and there's really that sense that Antony is at sea once he goes to sea. He's out of his element. His soldiers say to him, we were used to conquer on land, and, and sea is a kind of foreign element to it. And then he compounds it by letting... Cleopatra had part of the command, and then the most awful part when he follows her, re retreats uh, uh, with her, and loses everything and again. Uh, yet his soldiers remain loyal to, the, to him, uh, or at least many of them do. Uh, uh, and indeed, in some ways, they remain, the point is that they remain loyal to him in defeat. Uh, 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 Caesar, Octavius wins battles and so his uh, his soldiers may be following him just out of expediency uh, in a weird way Antony uh, 
uh, gets to see that his soldiers are loyal to him precisely to the extent that they stay loyal to him, uh, 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 even in defeat. Uh, there's a pre there's a remarkable scene. Uh, it's uh, Act Four, Scene Two, uh, 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 when uh, he's been defeated. Uh, but wants to have one last celebration. This is on page 100. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and thou art honest too, this is line 15, I wish I could be made so many men and all of you clapped up together in an antony that I might do you service so good as you have done. Uh, <laughs> that curious business and antony What's he doing there, just sort of parenthetically? Why does he speak of an Antony? He's a leader that we can follow. Yeah. Him, so by making himself the, the unit of, like, the example of a leader, he's yeah. giving himself kind of a compliment. Yeah, and what would be... It's like... A Caesar, it's. A, I I I think this is a, this is a gesture. Okay, it worked for Julius to turn his name into a title. Uh, Cleopatra speaks of an Antony later in the play several times. It's as if they're trying to start up the PR machine. Uh, you've had a Caesar, now you have an Antony. And, you know, if he had won, maybe the Russian leader would be called Antony and the German emperor would have been called Der Antonius and so on. It's a curious turn of phrase that Shakespeare introduced here. So uh, 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 the God said, well, my good fellows, wait on me tonight, scant not my cups, and make as much of me as when mine empire was your fellow too, and suffered my command. What does he mean to make his followers weep? Uh, Tend me tonight, may be it is the period of your duty. Haply you shall not see me more, or if a mangled shadow, perchance tomorrow you'll serve another master. I look on you as one that takes his leave. Mine honest friends, I turn you not away, but like a master married to your good service, stay till death. Tend me to, uh, tonight two hours, I ask no more, and the gods yield you for it. What you mean you, sir, to give them this discomfort? Look, they weep, and I, an ass, am onion eye. For shame, transform us not to women. Yeah. Where's Coriolanus? I miss Coriolanus. <laughs> yeah, because what, uh, again, what is so strange about this scene from a commanding officer? Uh, it's too bad we've had our soldier leave. He could have told us. He's talking like he's going, like it's not, his death is inevitable. Like there's no hope and there's no like determination. Yeah, is this, is this a good battle speech? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. St. Crispin's Day speech in Henry V. Or can you imagine George Patton saying this to the troops? Uh, Eisenhower getting out before D-Day and saying, you know, I'm probably going to be dead tomorrow. It's the last time you're ever going to see me. Uh, uh, and it uh, again, you see this amazing transformation of Rome here. And indeed, Ina Barber says, transform us not to women. Uh, he sees this as an uh, unmanning of Rome, uh, the death of Roman manliness uh, uh, here. And again, he surrounded himself with women and eunuchs in the play. It's really Cleopatra's court is an amazing image of unmanning. Uh, and so it's not an accident uh, that all this uh, is happening. But you, can you see the logic of it from his point of view? I shall have more glory by this losing day. Uh, Brutus articulated the logic. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. It is, and again, always look in this play, the new logic of losing. If I win, people may be loyal to me because I was a winner. 
out of ulterior motives. Only if I lose will I know who my real friends are. Uh, and he virtually challenges them to desert him here. Uh, uh, you know, Ina Barbus, it's like he's, uh, he's driven to, to leaving Antony here. Uh, now, how does this logic work out in terms of the love of Antony and Cleopatra? Because I think it's the identical logic, uh, this... Uh, uh, that plays out in their love. What are they looking for in this second half of the play? You know, their big problem is one of loyalty, too. Neither one really is assured of the faith of the other. Uh, uh, yeah. I think in some ways, um, Cleopatra's games, uh, both early on in the play that uh, Bill mentioned, and um, the, like, at the end where she says, oh, she's killed herself, and she wants, she expects him to come to her, but it's really a way of saying, of, like kind of forcing the other person to prove their loyalty by creating dramatic situations that don't really exist. It doesn't work out very well for her at the end. It's not a great but idea. It is. Don't it, try this at home. Right. It is an attempt in the same way that... Um, like if she when she says she's sick or she's dancing, it's meant to provoke a reaction, which proves loyalty essentially. Yeah. Remember, they ask for an infinite love. That's what they want at the beginning. How can you prove the infinity of your love? Yeah. In the most extreme circumstances, it's still apparent or evident. Like in the most extreme circumstances, like like how he like it commits. Suicide, essentially, and so does she. Yeah. And then, if you if you go back to the Battle of Actium, then when she to, when she sail, turns her ship around and sails away, she's forcing him to choose between his political and military fortunes or her. It's a very direct. Yeah. This this is that horrible moment in love. Do you really love me? And if you really love me, you will do X. It's a bad moment when you hear that. Uh, 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 and, uh, and, you know, the ultimate thing is, if you really love me, you would die for me. And it really, you know, what's in the measure against me? How about all of Rome versus me? You know, you want to prove your love is infinite. That's pretty good. Uh, John Dryden wrote a Antony and Cleopatra play that's called All for Love or the World Well Lost. It's not a very good play, and it's a gross oversimplification of Shakespeare's play, though it does have a cat fight between Octavia and Cleopatra. That's the one thing that Shakespeare missed out on. And <laughs> Dryden knew we need them to meet and have the 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 uh, the dr knockdown drag out Alexis Crystal cat fight uh, for all you old Dynasty fans. Uh, but uh, here, you know, uh, uh, ultimately the real measure of an infinite love would be dying for. Uh, the person you love. Now, Shakespeare had shown that in Romeo and Juliet, which is the logic of courtly love already, uh, really, or as he would say, the illogic of courtly love, that in some ways courtly love drives the lovers to die for each other. That's the great story of Tristan and Isolde, for example, which is all a story of love death. It builds up to a big love death. Uh, and here, by the way, the same gimmick of Romeo and Juliet. Uh, 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 Romeo gets to think Juliet is dead and then dies for her. Then Juliet w wakes up and dies for Romeo. Here, too, we got a, a kind of double love suicide here in that Cleopatra sends this false rumor uh, that she's died, and Antony commits suicide, and then when uh, when she learns of Antony's death, she does, unlike Romeo, unlike Juliet, she waits a while <laughs> to kill herself, and as uh, I forget who pointed out, 
Uh, indeed, it's not clear that she simply kills herself for Antony. She makes sure that there's no political out. But still, in the larger structure, you've got Act 4 devoted to the death of uh, suicide of Antony and Act 5 devoted to the suicide of Cleopatra and you get this kind of uh, double suicide and the notion of that, that they will meet uh, in, in another world which is very new uh, in Shakespeare's Rome uh, uh, but uh, uh, it is the ultimate logic here uh, of this world that you're seeking an infinite love how can you measure it? You can measure it against giving up the whole world, and that means suicide. Uh, uh, and, you know, it, uh, it's the way to settle their doubts. Uh, uh, in, in Anthony's case, uh, uh, you know, at first he feels so betrayed by Cleopatra. The only thing that settles his soul is the idea that she's killed himself. Or then she really was loyal. Uh, uh, and Cleopatra has been trying to prove this all along. Again, as people have said, the turning in battle is a test of Antony. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the opening lines of the play are really a keynote. Uh, if it be love indeed, tell me how much. That's the great craving in this world. There's a new craving for love and personal loyalty. Uh, uh, it, it used to be in the Republic you could, you could determine things in terms of the good of Rome. A nice contrast is the contrast between Volumnia and Octavia. Uh, remember, Volumnia says what a difficult position she's in at the end of the play when she says, I don't know who to root for. Uh, if my son wins, it's bad for my country. My country wins, it's bad for my son. I don't know what to do. But notice she does know what to do. In the end, she says, my country. Because uh, uh, she's essentially saying, any son that turns against my country is no son of mine. Octavia presents herself in a similar dilemma. I love my brother. I love my husband. I really don't know which way to turn. The difference there is it's a tension between two loyal, two personal loyalties. My brother, my husband. My brother, my husband. Not my son, my country. And you see how the, the good of Rome has dropped out in Antony and Cleopatra. That's one reason so many people have divided loyalties in this play. You know, Ina Barbus, do I serve Antony or Octavius? Um, Minus, do I serve Pompey or, or the uh, triumvirs? Uh, everything's gone personal, and no one can resolve the choices anymore uh, by simply evoking uh, the good of Rome. That's why you see so much uh, self-division. Uh, uh, in this world. Uh, now, uh, let's look at Cleopatra in that last act uh, uh, and how things work out uh, uh, for her. Look at her speech on uh, page 131. We see another sign of transformation here. Uh, uh, my desolation does begin to make a better life. And by the way, that's a, another, another kind of transformation. Your desolation makes a better life. And then here's, tis paltry to be Caesar. Uh, now you might say, what do you mean? It's the best thing in the world to be Caesar. Again, notice how the name has become a title there. Uh, uh, after all, you get to rule the whole world, but... Uh, 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 what is the logic of it? Uh, again, this seems like much, you know, you would feel like saying, hey, Caesar's better than consul. Uh, now one guy rules the whole of this empire for life. Why does she think it's, it's, it's paltry? Well, she, she, it, it, it represents the um, complete transformation from Corleonis to a fatalistic view of the world. And she's saying that 
uh, even though he's a powerful political leader, ultimately he's just entirely subservient to fortune, and he just has to react to what the world throws at him. So it's not really the yeah. best position. And you can understand then why you would shoot messengers all day long, mm -hmm. as you're frustrated at this way of the world. Yeah, it's even the weird thing is even Caesar is passive in this new system. Uh, it's as if he is a subject. Uh, uh, just as his subjects are, for precisely the reasons Antony articulated, a child could run this system. It's not a manifestation of virtue. And that's what she says when she says, not being fortune, he's but fortune's knave, a minister of her will. It's just luck. You, the consul could claim, this is a reward for my virtue. But now it's just luck. Remember, that's what the soothsayer told Antony. You know, it's your luck. You got bad luck. Caesar's always going to win these games when you're around him. Uh, uh, and there's much more sense of luckiness. And then she says, and it's great to do that thing which ends all other deeds, which shackles accents and bolts of chains, which sleeps and never pallets more the dung, the beggar's nurse and Caesar's. So incredible about that claim. <laughs> the dung is the beggar's nurse and Caesar's. Yeah. Well, just says that they are all equal. Like the patricians and the plebeians are all on the same level. They're only risen through, uh, not through nobility of blood, but through chance and luck. Yeah, you know, it's just you. Uh, uh, and it's I mean, she chooses dung as the equalizer here. This is again. I want you to see how fundamentally this world is transforming. We have been in a very aristocratic world. Uh, in which the, even the people accept this idea that they are inferior uh, to the noble orders. They don't particularly like it, and they don't like to be treated like dung. Uh, uh, but uh, the premise of this world is that some people are better by nature. And the odd thing is, you would think that the world of Caesar has created an even greater gulf than in a way it has. But in fact, the difference between plebeian and patrician has been erased by the emergence of a Caesar. Uh, that it has, uh, it has wiped out what used to be the fundamental uh, Roman distinction. Uh, it, it, it hardly matters whether you're a patrician now, right? Uh, it used to be a big deal. But now the patricians, get, you know, they got no more role in the empire than the plebeians do. So it's very curious if you see what happens here. We've finally gotten to democracy here. This is by a circuitous route. This is the most democratic line we've heard in these plays. Uh, even the plebeians never got up and said, we're just as good as you are. Uh, uh, but now... Uh, we're here. There's no difference between the beggar's nurse uh, and 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 Caesar. Uh, by the way, this is a you know this is quite a motif of the play. Look at uh, page one twenty six. Uh, uh, Cleopatra's reaction to to Antony's death, uh, uh, line sixty two. The crown of the earth doth melt. My lord, O oh, withered is the garland of the war. The soldier's pole has fallen. Young boys and girls are level now with men. The odds is gone, and there is nothing left remarkable beneath the visiting moon. This is one of the odd things that Shakespeare points out about the empire. A, a leveling effect uh, uh, that it has. Uh, the notion of the great man is disappearing. The Republic, which turned on having so many great men. And look at uh, line 72. No more but e'en a woman, 
and commanded by such poor passion as the maid that milks and does the meanest chairs. Uh, her, her equality with uh, her servants. Uh, uh, and it is interesting that, uh, yeah, I'll go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, how is this, this whole uh, equality argument really unique to empire, though? Because if the premise is that we're just all powerless to fortune, why do you need, how is that unique to an imperial system? Couldn't that always be true? Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. But but what's, what we've had, is what's, what's important here is a Republican system, which was arist aristocratic, gets wiped out by the empire. In other words, this, in a weird way, this is the democratizing of aristocratic Rome. In other words, what's, what's important here is how Rome got to a point where you could even think that all men are equal only when the imperial throne erase the distinction between patrician and plebeian. So it's in the sense that the all people, patrician and plebeian, they're all subjects of the emperor. Yes. I mean, that makes sense to me, but I guess I just don't see how then you get to this even Caesar being the same as the subjects. That seems to be a different argument that's not... Really yes, but it is this point that even his... his uh, it, this thing could be ruled by an emperor, by a, by 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 a child, and that Octavius isn't emperor by virtue of any virtue, but just by a kind of luck. Uh, and indeed, the idea is that Antony was the greater man, and Caesar is Caesar uh, because of luck, and in a way because of his ordinariness, uh, because he fits in, and it is a, you know it's a curious feature of the the imperial system that the the emperor himself was a kind of slave he became a slave to the army uh you know often the you know the army chose the empire the army would kill uh kill the emperor uh so you know there's nobody who has human agency anymore in this world they're all part of a system and what's interesting is uh now, the erasing of the distinction between even master and slave. Uh, in Julius Caesar, we start to see it happen in that... Uh, now, we... we the, uh, let's see. There are no slaves in Coriolanus because, again, the plebeians are not slaves. Uh, uh, and we see... Plebeians and patricians not meet on a plane of equality, but... Uh, let's say a plane of familiarity, and they, uh, in in some cases, like Menenius and Sicinius and Brutus, they do talk together. Uh, uh, in Julius Caesar, there are those interesting scenes between Brutus and his servant boy. Uh, he's very kind to his servant boy, but notice here, Cleopatra is saying. Uh, commanded by such poor passion as the mind that milks and does the meanest chairs. And she is on a remarkable plane of equality with her servants. I think you said that, or somebody over here said that, that when you looked at her court. Uh, uh, and remember, just go back to page 100, where Antony uh, says uh, to his servants... I wish I could be made so many men and all of you clapped up together in an ante that I might do you service so good as you have done. It's like, I want to serve you now. Uh, 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 it's a reversal of the master-servant relation. Now, somewhat, you had a comment. Um, I think this point about uh, the equalizing between the master and the servants is really interesting. It's not something I would have ever thought about in a play where these main characters are so enormous. Um, just to like present a tension in this, even at the very end of the play, um, when Cleopatra is getting ready to commit suicide, she can she kisses Iris, and Iris just dies. Um, that it that to me seems to be this indication that Cleopatra is this such so much larger than life that. So it's almost a different kind of being. Yes, and 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 uh, 
she goes to her death as a queen. Uh, this is page 143. Give me my robe, put on my crown. Uh, I got unplugged here. Oh, I see. Yeah, all right. There we go. <laughs> uh, acoustic canter. Canter unplugged. Uh, but but uh, the... Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm a guy who wrote a book called Gilligan Unbound. So what? But but anyway, uh, I don't want to deny that Anne and Cleopatra both have a, a very high opinion of themselves. They want preeminence. They want to stand up peerless. Uh, they want the whole world to look up to them. But there's this curious way in which they achieve that by inverting the master-slave relationship and saying. Look how admirable I am. I'm at your level. And it's amazing, you know, the democratic speeches they give. Now, again, it's not modern democracy, and let's not be anachronistic about it, but they both work to erase the distinction between uh, master and servant. Uh, and that tells you a lot about uh, uh, this world. And indeed, it's a world where the old form of great man is no longer visible. It's died out. The, the Coriolanus type figure is gone. Uh, when, when Octavius invokes Antony uh, as a warrior, he thinks back to the Battle of Modena uh, and indeed mentions there Hurtius and Panza, the last two consuls of the real republic. And there is the sense that uh, 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 that kind of manly virtue is a characteristic of the past. Uh, and we've entered a strange new world here uh, uh, in which Antony and Cleopatra achieve some kind of new preeminence which is based on love and which is based on the notion that uh, Caesarism is paltry and has, in fact, erased the distinctions. Um, this is a world in which the old distinctions are gone and people are searching for new forms of distinction. It's very powerful in play. Uh, 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 and they do achieve a kind of triumph, uh, though it is curiously a triumph uh, in the afterlife, and indeed, uh, uh, right back on page 126, uh, when Cleopatra is articulating the meaning of the death of Antony, and remember, we keep hearing the son of Rome is set, this was the last of the Romans, no, that was the last of the Romans, now we in effect hearing Antony's the last of the Romans, uh, we keep, we're, we're running out of Romans, guys. We are really running out of Romans here. And then Cleopatra asks, line 79, then is it sin to rush into the secret house of death ere death dare come to us? Uh, this is the first mention of suicide as a sin in this world. Uh, uh, and why has it become a sin? Because you're taking fate's power and using it on yourself. Basically, you're taking away fate's power by uh, and taking away whatever destiny that you had. Because um, everything's just kind of up to destiny. But if you yeah. cut yourself out of your destiny, essentially, um, you're messing with that power. Why didn't Brutus and Cassius think that suicide was a sin? Yeah. Because. It was a way for you to prevent becoming a bond man. You, you had that power in yourself to prevent it. And this seems to say that, like Sheila mentioned, you, that isn't really in your power, your control anymore, because that human agency is gone. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say that uh, Bruce and Cassius, I think, were the last kind of representatives of this. Um, and even then, we saw kind of, it, it was kind of faulty, but they were representatives of this human agency. And with that, I mean, you're it's fully in your power to take your own life, and it's even noble at times. But if you're no longer the, uh, you know, 
if there's no element of human agency, then it's you no longer own your life. You can no longer kill yourself and have it be noble. And in fact, it's like taking it from someone. Yeah, they're doing it to prevent dishonor. And frankly, clear. It is so strange because Cleopatra does ultimately commit suicide to preserve her honor, but what? Yeah, I was just gonna say, it's kind of odd because when she's talking about tis paltry to be Caesar, she then follows it up with, and it is great to do that thing that ends all other deeds, which shackles accidents and bolts up change. Um, to me, that seems like it's a reference to suicide. Yeah, and indeed, on 127, uh, let's do it after the high Roman fashion. There is a sense in which her most Roman moment comes when she decides to commit suicide, which she knows is a Roman thing. Though notice, she won't fall on a sword. Uh, she, uh, uh, she doesn't want, she's studied infinite w ways to die, and she, doesn't, she wants to do it pleasantly. But uh, was there some other comment on this over well, there? I was just going to say that it's sort of a, this is a curious way of pronouncing suicide because it's saying, well, uh, you really ought to um, allow fate to control you, basically, yeah. and, and that um, killing yourself is bad because it gets you out of the hands of fate. But that, that sentence implies agency. I mean, it, the very fact that you can yes. choose to get out of your destiny means that it's not really your destiny. Right, and indeed she does ultimately commit suicide to escape her, her destiny. But um, uh, why does Christianity forbid suicide? Suicide was in fact a capital crime in England, uh, believe it or not. Uh, uh, there were technical reasons for that, namely so the crown could take all, all your property and it wouldn't pass to your heirs. Uh, why is suicide tempting in Christianity? Well, the afterlife is um, supposed to be probably a lot better. And so yeah. it's, not, it's not a sin, then there's always a chance that if your life is not so great here, it could be much better. Yeah. Now notice the parallels to Cleopatra here. She's just said life here is dung or, you know, uh, uh, everything remarkable is gone, life is worse, worthless, then is it a sin to rush into the sea? You know, in other words, uh, when uh, uh, Romans like Brewers and Cassius are not killing themselves because they think this life is worthless. They're killing themselves because to continue life would be in dishonor for them. Uh, and again, that's Roman suicide, and in many ways that is really the motive behind Cleopatra's suicide as it emerges. But here we've seen this transformation. Once you think that this lot, the odds is gone, there's nothing remarkable, this world is all done, uh, then suicide becomes a sin, especially when you start to think in terms of an afterlife, as she has done, and as Antony has done, uh, next time we can come back to the Dido and Aeneas Juan troops speech. So this play has from the beginning to the end an otherworldliness about it. Though. New heaven, new earth. Yeah, yeah it's ex from the beginning. It, it's exploring the possibility of a new heaven, new earth, which is saying this play is exploring the possibility of Christianity. Yeah, that the the real alternative that emerges to Rome in this play is Christianity. Uh, uh. If I may ask a slightly different question, is there, how is it that we can start to think through fatalism as inherently de democratic, as opposed to where, where we didn't see fatalism earlier in the earlier plays so much, and it was distinctly aristocratic that these people were making their own way? That once these things are ultimately subject to chance, you pointed out distinctions then yeah. are lost, and then in this way we, we come to a sort of democracy. This, I'm just... Yeah, I, I, I hesitate to call it democracy because, it, you know, it is like, uh, you know, Hegel's notion of oriental despotism, all are enslaved. In some ways, that's the antithesis of what we think of as democracy. But again, what I'm showing you here is how an aristocratic order is wiped out. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, if I just Not how a democratic order is founded. Well, just to finish on the end of it, is you really warned us about seeing Shakespeare saying things are universal. Yeah. Unless it feels as if universals are starting to come up through these three plays. 
speaking about human nature. So. Oh, yes, we understand human nature. What I'm saying is certain human possibilities are not universally available. Yes. Yeah, and that you, so, uh, and indeed, what we are seeing here is emerge a universal order. The Roman Empire, which is a world empire, and we're seeing one of the aspects of a universal empire is the wiping out of aristocratic distinctions and all people are equal in a slave sense. That, uh, so it's actually, a uni watch out for a universal order, the way Alexander Kojev and Leo Strauss would talk about a universal order. Yes? Uh, in the week that we did Tocqueville, we talked about what Tocqueville thinks the difference between history and aristocratic regimes and democratic regimes are, and he says that in aristocratic, there's a lot of emphasis on men and, and their human agency, and then in democratic histories, they don't talk about people or individual yeah. actions. It's all about general causes and yeah. um, sociological um, it's, yeah. circumstances, and yeah. this, this seems to come through. And he does, Tocqueville worries about how the individual is weighed down by the democratic mass. He's told he's free, and he's told he can have his own opinion, but he's afraid of thinking differently from anybody else. These are all interesting aspects. Anyway, we have to stop here, but uh, next time, think for a moment about how Christian all of this is, uh, uh, that uh, uh, nobility is losing and weakness is strength and death is life. It's something we'll talk about next time in connection with the play.